There's three. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just uh, at seven o'clock, I'd like to call this uh, meeting to order, and we need to do a motion uh, first off to uh, conclude. Uh, Travis Longest and uh, Gene Campbell uh, by Zoom or whatever they're whatever we're using. And so can I move? So uh, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. So what you need, Chris? Okay. All right. Um, so let's see. Roll call is uh, it's next on the agenda. Chris, can you do that first? Here. 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 Yeah, present. Mr. Slater. Here. Ms. Fight. Here. Mr. Wagner. Here. Mr. Greenwood. Here. And Mr. Breeden. Here. So um, tonight, this is a, a, a really terrific thing. And I, I think um, um, Mr. Ashcroft um, has, has certainly helped in this, but we're, we're all starting to communicate better and and um, work together, collaborate, and that's never a bad thing. And so we're we're lucky to have the planning commission, who's clearly out dressed as all, um, <laughs> here, here with us tonight. And that won't happen again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so anyway, we're, we're we're fortunate that they've agreed to to crash our meeting. And uh, to participate, we're, um, we've got a great agenda tonight. Um, I, um, we've got, some, got lots of good stuff going on. And uh, um, I don't know, did, 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 did you want to say something or? Uh, yes, uh, so, so we have our first comprehensive, really solid comprehensive plan in the past uh, 18 or so years. We, we had one in 2016 that was put together because it was out of date, but this has been thoroughly researched, and I think it provides, I think it's going to provide us a great roadmap for, for the future growth of the county. An important part of that is economic development, and that's why we wanted to get you folks involved in, in looking at the comp plan and looking at the future land use map and, and, and helping make sure that it's the best comprehensive plan we can. So I thank you for inviting us to join you tonight. But that's fantastic. So, um, Let's see. So uh, next up, we need to uh, review and adopt the meeting agenda. Um, I, um, is everybody okay with it? Does we need to have any discussion? Um, no, we need to adopt it. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. Um, we need to review our minutes from uh, February 9th and uh, February 14th of um, Chris, do you want us to approve these, review and approve them? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So can somebody give me a motion? One motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Um, Joint meeting matters. Uh, tonight, we've got a, a couple of presentations, I think, uh, that will be in, informative, um, both to the EDA and to and, and the Planning Commission. Uh, we've got RKG, who's going to be with us and join us and uh, give us the second installment of some work that they're doing for us. There's, there's a second phase to this uh, that gets into specific site identification. Um, and, and it's going to help us identify specific things that the EDA can go out and, and target and, and implement, right? So they're going to give us kind of a dot, 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 you know? And, um, and so where that has some influence is um, how, how the economic piece meets and joins up with the planning piece. And, and so I, I hope that, and I think I'm confident that, that uh, we're all going to learn something tonight. Um, and, and hopefully it'll, it'll have some influence in, in the plan, you know, in the master plan. So, and, and then after, after we have RKG, uh, later on, we've got uh, Chris Couch, who's going to present uh, a, a model uh, 
uh, on the cost <laughs> of residential development. So, um, so let's see. So um, I guess we can dive, dive right into to, to, um, to Kyle's uh, presentation. So Kyle, are you with us? I am here. Can you hear me? Good evening. Good evening. How is everybody today? Excellent. Uh, I am going to share my screen with you, hopefully. Well, do, 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 would it um, would it help just to uh, maybe spend two minutes talking about what you've done so far and where we are and how this fits into what we did before? They, some some of these folks haven't had the advantage of participating in that. Sure, absolutely. So uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Kyle Talenti. I am the president of RKG Associates. We are a real estate economic development and planning consulting firm. Uh, and to, to meet's point, um, this is the second installment of the first phase to be as confusing as I possibly can be uh, of the work that we're doing to help uh, establish some economic development goals and strategies. Um, the first presentation we did, which was about a month ago that I believe is attached to the minutes for this meeting, focused on the target industry analysis that we uh, prepared for the county and, and culminated in some recommended um, industry uh, clusters that we believe if the county were to proactively market towards, have the greatest potential for success um, that for in terms of uh, helping existing businesses grow and attract new businesses to the county. Uh, we've, we kind of finished that conversation around um, understanding just in some very general terms, some ideas, some pot potential strategies and opportunities that could uh, arise based on the result of that analysis. This evening's presentation, building upon that is we were asked to do a preliminary fiscal study uh, to understand what the impact of development is and to provide some first blush recommendations. So kind of fleshing out a little bit of the conversation that we had uh, the last time as a group. And so that's what I'm here to present this evening. Um, I don't mean to steal uh, Chris's thunder a little bit. I, I had the opportunity to kind of go through his slideshow. And while I don't get near into the detail of data that he does, we did, we did a similar analysis um, I am going to probably steal a little bit of his of his findings, so I, I do want to apologize uh, about that. So at any rate, um, moving forward. So what we were trying to do is understand the potential impacts of development, right? We talked about uh, the potential businesses that may be attracted to the community. And, and when Mead and I had talked uh, several months ago when we first started investigating the potential of doing this, is there was also the component of, okay, well, how do we also ensure that everybody understands not just the types of businesses that we should be looking at, but the, the balance of how different development opportunities create different fiscal impacts. Uh, when you boil down economic development uh, to its, its, its brass uh, tax, if you will, there's job retention, expansion, and creation is kind of one mantle. And then there's the fiscal sustainability, which is creating opportunities to um, help the community to uh, continue to operate successfully without trying to overburden or or having to overburden um, the residents and existing businesses by creating new opportunities. And so what we looked at was the potential incremental impacts of new development on the locally focused revenues and costs. And that's really the, the overarching statement. So the two things that I want to make sure that we're all understanding is what is incremental impact and what are locally focused revenues and expenditures, because those are important components for the types of fiscal analysis that RKG does. So an incremental impact in its purest form is a cost or a revenue to the county that changes as a direct result of that new development. And so costs are gener cost and revenues are generally broken down into to fixed uh, costs and, and revenues and incremental costs and revenues. So a fixed cost, for example, would be your county administrator. Um, we could build several new businesses, we could build several new homes, and you're not going to hire a second county administrator. And so that particular cost is fixed. And so we isolate that from the analysis because we don't need to account for that individual salary because it's not going to change. On the flip side is the incremental piece. And the easiest way to understand that is around school teachers. So school teachers are incremental costs because you need a certain number of school teachers for every child that's in the in the county. So every time you bring more school-age children that are enrolled into the public schools, 
that's going to add a new cost, which is having to have that additional teacher resource uh, to be able to educate those kids. Because you can't just keep adding kids to the fixed number of teachers because you, then you get out of, out of um, sync with uh, uh, mandates and requirements. And so that's the easiest way to kind of understand the difference between fixed and incremental. And so we want to make sure that we look at this analysis and we're doing it and showing you truly what the impacts, the costs and the revenues are based on new development. And then the way we understand those relationships is by looking at your budget and looking at your, your, your CAFR. And we, we analyze those and break them down and then try to go through and identify, well, is this a fixed cost or an incremental cost? And then we do that analysis. The other piece is locally focused. And that's another, that's another critical component for us. Simply put is it's a revenue that comes directly to the county or it's an expense that is directly incurred by the county. You have a lot of funding sources that come to the county for different things, the federal government, the state, um, you know, property owners, businesses, users of your public facilities. And we wanna make sure that we're looking at ones that are generated the revenue and the cost locally. So schools, yet again, is another easy one to discuss because a large portion of the county school budget is pass-throughs or what we call pass-throughs, which are revenues that are earmarked from the state or the feds and that are tied to your enrollment numbers. And so the, basically what they say is we're gonna cover a certain percentage of your costs for each student. And if you add a student, your cost goes up for that student, but then the revenue that comes from outside the community goes up for that student, come, uh, increases for, the, for that student as well. And so the reason why we try to isolate and get rid of those is because it's generally a watch. The cost goes up by a certain amount and then that additional external revenue source covers that cost. So we uh, isolate and remove those and focus solely on what the potential impact is locally. Um, and then we al the allocation of revenues and costs have to be considered, right? So what is the relation? What is the responsibility of a new business as opposed to what is the responsibility of a new uh, household? And so we go through your budget and we go through your revenues and we say, okay, is this uh, earmarked for you know the residents? Is this earmarked for a business or is it both? And so I have some examples here on the screen. Obviously, schools is a residential impact. We could put as many businesses as we want into uh, King William County. Those businesses don't create new students to, to the community. The residents who move in to take those jobs if they bring their children with them do, but the businesses themselves do not. On the flip side of the coin is your expenditures for economic development activities is 100% focused on serving existing and potential new businesses. And so that, that's a cost that, is, that needs to be borne by uh, the, the business community and not by the residents. And then of course, there are services that serve both. Uh, emergency services, police, fire, EMT, they, they are available to both residential and non-residential users. And so you have to allocate and account for that in your analysis. Just so you all know, when we looked at your uh, budget or your, excuse me, your, your um, uh, assessed value, your property land bank book, um, excuse me, is you're about 95% of the value of the county, taxable value in the county is residential and 5% is non-residential. And so that is important from the standpoint of that's how we break down ratios, particularly for those shared costs um, that to try and understand who is responsible for what. So you're looking at here a, a graphic that shows you how we allocated based on different department types, um, the, those revenues that come to the county. Is it property taxes? Obviously both are gonna generate them. So they're both responsible for it. Business taxes obviously are 100% related to your, your, the businesses that are here. Emergency services, our, our history of doing this, we know that uh, commercial industrial actually use more than their proportional share of those. And so we, we have what we call uh, uh, commercial and industrial heavy. So we increase the, the, the responsibility of the commercial industrial side as opposed to the residential. And you could see here, and in the model itself, there are uh, several other categories. We just wanted to kind of give you a flavor of how it looks both from the residential side and then also from the expenditure side, right? What, where is it proportional? Where is it more uh, commercial industrial heavy, or where is it more specifically either residential or non-residential? And you can see second from the bottom, schools are 100% allocated to the residential component of your community. And so um, there's a lot that goes into this, and I'm trying to be uh, kind of uh, uh, at the surface level. If you have specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. But this is kind of the punchline of, of looking at it. So when we looked at the, the value of new construction housing in the county, it generally has ranged between $250,000, $350,000 per unit. Now that's not an absolute, but that is kind of the, the primary band. 
And so we said, okay, well, let's look at what type of revenue is generated by a $250,000 home and what type of revenue is generated by a $350,000 home. And so when we allocated the, the costs or the revenues by the different uh, revenue sources and then and looked at it, and this is how it breaks down. Uh, and you can see here, we estimate that a quarter of a million dollar home generates about $3,500 in revenue. And obviously the higher property taxes increases the amount of revenue from a, a larger home. And then we looked at it from an expenditure perspective. And what is going to be of no surprise to anybody is the impacts of schools is the, the, the lion's share majority of the impact of expenditures. Uh, we used an, an estimate of about 0.75 new students uh, per housing unit uh, it, as our average. And that was based off of the average household size of the county, which is about 2.75. And so we assumed, okay, if you, you assume two adults, then the other is a 0.75. Um, and so you can see how the cost breaks down. And if just to float, you can see here that from a residential perspective at 0.75 uh, school-aged children, we don't cover our costs. It comes close at the $350,000 home, but it doesn't quite cover the costs. Well, we did the same kind of analysis for the non-residential uses in the county. We look at it both from an industrial perspective because it has a different um, assessed value per square foot for new construction than commercial. And so you're, what you're looking at here is a, whereas residential was on a per unit basis, this is on a per square foot basis. So you see from a revenue perspective, industrial generates about $4.25 per square foot, a little bit more than $6 for commercial. When we looked at it from an expenditure perspective, once again, one of the biggest differences being that there are no school costs, um, it's about 60 cents per square foot. So obviously non-residential development is generating a, a net positive impact to the county. So um, we, I created this kind of summary trying to give you a sense of where it all lands, right? Because we also wanted to look at it from a break-even analysis. And so the net fiscal impact of, you know, based on the development analysis is negative for the three and 250 to $350,000 house at $450,000, it would actually create a positive impact, um, assuming 0.75 kids. So we also looked at it from a break even. And so what you can see here is, you know, if you don't create any children, the net revenue from a new household is, is net positive, even a, in a $50,000 home. Um, the impact really starts to show up when you bring in children. And so a, a, a household with one child in the school system would require a housing value of almost $480,000 just for the county to break even. And then when you bring in two children, it's a net near a million dollars of value for that house to, to uh, uh, account for the costs that are being borne locally, the incremental costs being borne locally for those kids. So just to kind of give you a sense of where this lands. Um, uh, and like I said, I'm sure Chris is going to come show similar type of analysis with similar types of results. So I do apologize about that. And then you can see here the net fiscal impact is is positive, with the biggest difference being that um, retail, uh, commercial, uh, particularly retail, gen it has a much higher per square foot value, and then also creates local apportionment sales tax, and also if it's a restaurant, creates local meals tax. And so that's the reason why you see a higher number for the commercial than for the industrial. And so that's, that's just kind of the summary of that particular analysis. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we were also kind of asked to kind of give some very high level preliminary recommendations as part of this phase one, kind of, you know, just based on the look that we did and the engagement, the communication we've had, the review of the, the, the comp plan process, you know, what are some of the things that we would look at? So I kind of broke it down into a couple of categories. The first one being land use. Um, you know, one of the recommendations we would have is plan non-residential growth for the long haul. We wanna make sure that you're not just identifying properties that could meet the need for the next two or five years, but you're truly looking at identifying par parcels uh, out 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And the primary reason for that is that, you know, with the demand for residential, not just in King William County, but frankly, throughout uh, Eastern Virginia, is that if you zone something for residential, it's going to generally become residential a whole lot faster than it will be commercial. And since we are number one, a relatively uh, rural community, and number two, we have limited access to in particular water sewer, if you wanna try and create a better balance of residential to non-residential, and 95% and residential, 5% non-residential is fairly unbalanced. Most communities target 
trying to get to 25 to 30 percent of their total uh, taxable land value to being non-residential, just to kind of give you a flavor of feel of where where that generally lands. Will you say that again? Most communities, most communities try to get to about 25 to 30 percent of their total uh, taxable land value to be non-residential. And we have five percent right now. Yes. And so um, and so obviously from a strategic and from an infrastructure perspective, focusing along 30 and, and 360 is going to be the most important thing the county can do uh, for just from a a market perspective, that's where those businesses are going to want to be for visibility and for transportation access perspective. But like I said, also from an infrastructure, because that's where the infrastructure exists. Uh, the next piece would be establish residential policies to balance quality of life and community character. For those of you who were with us last time when I presented last month, you know, there's a I, I know there's a strong desire in the community to see an increase of retail services to improve quality of life. And when we looked at the, the spending analysis, it was shown that we're really not very strong right now to be able to attract much more. Uh, there is demand for you know, new restaurant space and maybe augmenting some of your existing businesses, but there's very limited other opportunities to attract entire new businesses. And so, as I mentioned last time, I'll say again, the primary way that you're going to be able to become more viable there is to increase spending potential, which means more households in your community. However, I also recognize that there is a community character and a scale that uh, King William prides itself in, and, and values very highly. And so, you know, balancing between those two, I think is gonna be an important piece. So some of the ideas here, maximize the potential of areas that have water and sewer that are earmarked for residential. So look to see if you can do higher um, per, per unit per acre development so that you can get more, in, more households, which means more spending, which means more potential for additional commercial space. Um, central garage is definitely the area where we would encourage you to try and cluster that residential development. The closer in that is, the more likely they will be to, to um, uh, uh, patronize businesses in the central garage area. If they're all the way on the western edge of the county, they could head further west towards 95 and that corridor. If they're further east in the county, they could, they could consume uh, um, in that area or even jump down into the, the, the James City County Williamsburg area. And so having it in Central Garage is gonna be the greatest potential to try and strengthen that retail core that you already have established in the community. Um, consider expanding medium density and mixed use areas, in, both in terms of their footprint, uh, as well as in terms of the allowable density in those areas. You know, and, and I kind of put this in here because we, we had a good conversation about this last time. You know, I understand the community wants a pharmacy, but is it enough to allow the, that type of housing development needed? And we'll talk in a little bit about future steps in terms of using a build-out analysis to determine if what we've identified in the, in the comp plan is gonna be satisfactory to be able to meet some of these, particularly the commercial quality of life uh, goals that we have. The next one is to consider a light industrial zoning classification that can be create both a buffer between heavy industry areas and residential areas. That's the one, one benefit it creates. The second benefit, it, it creates a little bit more flexibility in some properties in our mind, particularly along the south end of 360, uh, uh, that where you can have flexibility, could it go retail, could it go to you know, lighter, smaller scale industrial, and it allows you some flexibility. And so we think adding that in as an opportunity can help from an economic development perspective as the community grows and as markets change. So you don't have to keep either rezoning or do out of turn plan amendments and those sorts of things. Um, it, it also, like I mentioned, also helps scale back from some larger, heavier users, both existing that you have now and as potential as if, if a new user comes on board. It's a good way to create a buffer. You know, unfortunately, in, in many communities, there are, are lots of stories where a, uh, a good commercial or industrial use existed and existed for a long period of time. And then residential, you know, started getting developed and it butted right against that. And the neighbors who moved in got very unhappy because they didn't like the noise or they didn't like the smell or they didn't like the lighting that was there. And then they complained and unfortunately then those businesses get driven out. And so the goal here is definitely not to displace particularly some of the, 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 the little non-residential activity that we have, but it is how do we do it and do it in harmony. And so those, those light industrial uh, zoning classifications can help create a buffer, uh, particularly in areas that are not right on 30 or 360 that which is where any new retail is gonna wanna be. And then finally, and this is, uh, uh, 
an economic, just an observation based on development trends, you know, we recommend you make self-storage a conditional use. Uh, you have a substantial amount of it. It has been a good bit of the development that has occurred in the county in the past several years. And from an economic development perspective, it is it doesn't yield jobs or it doesn't yield many jobs. It doesn't yield high paying jobs. It's marginal in terms of the tax revenue it generates because those buildings aren't the highest quality. And so there are if we're truly going to try and bring in non-residential development and we're only going to have a certain amount of land area to do that, this is one of the, the least valuable uses from an economic development perspective. The next one is capitalize on the logistic potential in Western Route 30. I'm going to flip my slide just for a second here. Uh, this is the this is the um, comp plan map that was shared with me. I'm talking about over here on the Caroline border. We talked about this last time we were together, but for those who weren't there, um, it's a straight shot along 30 past uh, Kings Dominion to 95. And if there was appropriately zoned land, uh, warehousing, distribution, those types of uses likely would have some some potential in that part of the county. And since there isn't water and sewer out here, those types of uses, uses are the most likely because they're just not heavy water users like, for example, um, uh, the, the uh, paper uh, uh, facility and then the, the Perina facility. And so we encourage considering looking at more um, opportunities for that logistics over here. I'm not, we're not as bullish on doing that on the 360 and 30 quarter in this area. We think that there is potential for production-based economic development. And as you grow residentially more commercial-based uh, economic development, which is gonna have a higher um, taxable value. It's going to have, create more jobs. It's going to create better jobs. And so we would like to see those uses focused here where, and if we're going to try and address logistics, this, this seems to be the most likely and also most cost effective. Um, and so, like I mentioned, this is the, 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 the land use map I put in both. So I, I may refer back to each of these as we walk through the conversation. But, you know, when I talked about that light industrial zoning whether it's to be to surround existing heavier industrial uses, the, the south side, south end of 360 I mentioned, this would be a good candidate for that light industrial because it does give you more flexibility. And frankly, right now, the amount of land that is zoned for true commercial development is just a lot more than, than what we need. And so, you know, to try and encourage additional economic development, particularly um, wealth generating economic development, which is more that production based and creating better paying oftentimes with some form of benefits jobs, that lighter industrial zone, I hope you see my, I hope you can see my cursor as I move it, but the yeah. light industrial zone um, on that south end of 360 we think is, is appropriate. So you just said something, Kyle, that, that it wasn't, um, you said that you thought that we had enough commercial or, or the way you said it made me think that you were thinking maybe there's too much. Yeah, well, I, I, that's, I, I think right now, if we're, if we're talking very bluntly, yes, I think for the amount of demand, demand and the foreseeable future demand, you probably do have more land zone for straight up commercial than you probably need. But this is the reason why I go back to rather than rezone it residential or zone it heavy industrial, that light industrial classification gives it flexibility where you can allow either by right conditional uses, commercial, you know, traditional retail uses in there as well. So if that demand for that does pick up, you, you, you don't have to rezone and it's already there, but it also gives flexibility so that as additional, you know, whether it be like small scale uh, manufacturers or small scale support industrial businesses for some of the larger industrial users that we have both here in our county and in the surrounding, you know, marketplace, it, it gives flexibility so that it's, it's not just going to be sitting there fallow, at least for the foreseeable future. Well, is there a problem with, with zoning it? Because, it, you know, in, in 100 years, we'll, we'll need it. Is Absolutely. No, no, no. I, this, uh, it, it, you listen, if, if the choice is adding a light industrial district or leaving it as commercial and, or turning it to residential, let's leave it commercial. I would rather leave it there and let it be there for future non-residential growth, whatever that may be, you know, 20, 40, 50, 70, 80 years from now. Absolutely. That is a much better choice from our perspective, from an economic development perspective, than just rezoning it residential saying, ah, oh, we don't really need it. But on the flip side of the coin, I think the better alternative than leaving it commercial would be that light industrial classification. So then it may develop sooner than that. But is there a problem and is there a downside to, to having so much commercial uh, uh, land available for development? 
Uh, it, it, the, the only downside to it is if you see too many entities or individuals trying to develop and market it simultaneously, you, you actually create what we define as you create your own competition. And so if I want to be in King William County and there are seven sites that are, that are pad ready to be built as a, as a fast food restaurant, for example, just to use that as, a, as, a, as an example, well, I can now play those seven different property owners off of each other to try and get a better deal than if it was just one or two and I had to make that decision. Um, it, it, we actually devalue our land. We make it less competitive when we have too much available immediately. So the real downside to having it would be is if there was too much speculative activity, it could create a negative valuation impact, uh, uh, which, which is a very uh, nerdy way of saying it could force property owners to give value away or to devalue their properties to be able to attract that one user. Because if there's only one user and there's, you know, if demand is one and supply is seven, the, the odds are in the, the demand's favor, if that makes sense. This so, is uh, uh, just two things. I think it was in your last presentation that you talked about, we have a lot, but there's also not really a set of price. Like we've got a couple sites that just have a four by eight sheet of plywood saying for sale, call this number <laughs> price that becomes, well, how much are you going to pay? So I think, you know, we do have that, but then to get back to the reclassification of zoning, um, the gentleman on the other side table may know, what was it? Is it 2005 or six where we came down 360 and did everything B1, B2 and like a rampant rezoning? And then there's residential houses there, like we've got one. And I, I don't believe it was resolved. I think it was on the feature land. That was a projection of the uh, classification. And of course, the 2008 crash yeah. uh, and everything else, there's not been that much development. So we just now coming back to the amount of development. So it was not rezoned. I think it was feature land. I I think it was um, like there's people still living in houses, but they're B1 but they right. can stay there residentially as long as they want to be residential. So I think that's why almost every property is some sort of B1, B2. And then Kyle, when you say a light industrial, is that creating a new classification or is that, or is that the B1, B2? It, it's a new classification. Okay. We, we've talked about having light industrial for quite some time, specifically for the commerce part. Yeah. But we do not have a light industrial for the classification. Kyle, is that something that you would recommend? Yes. I, well, it would either be to look at uh, buy right and conditional uses in B1, B2 and see if you want to make that the adjustment or to create a whole new classification. Um, you know, I, I haven't looked in depth enough at it to be able to weigh in one way or another, but either one of those could satisfy what our recommendation is, which is to create greater flexibility in those properties so that it's not just retail or just industrial, but it can be some sort of hybrid zoning. That would be good because I find like when we bring prospects to the zoning office, it seems like certain businesses get on that list based on being told yes or no. And if we do have more appointed classification, that would get, get us maybe out of black and white, put us in the gray, which would, you know, more business friendly, like your term. So, 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 yeah. So, what the, the when you're talking about, um, you know, the the risk reward paradigm that businesses always weigh when they're considering locations. Um, the two primary things that are generally looked for is consistency and predictability. And consistency is to be able to predict to understand how the community is going to react because you have a a history of of of, of a similar situation and then reacting in a, in a consistent manner. And then predictability is if I want to come and do you know a small ten thousand square foot uh, light manufacturing operation and it's not a buy right or it's not even conditional use, the my ability to predict that you're going to approve it at the end when I have to spend tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to get to that decision point is going to scare me off. And so to that point, yes, I think creating greater flexibility within your zoning so that it could become more consistent and more predictable to the end user will make you look more business friendly. One of the things we've heard quite a bit in the last couple of years, and we've never been told it empirically by a professional, is that we are more suited for light manufacturing than a lot of other things. 
which would then warrant us having a light manufacturing uh, designation districts and, and identify where it would fit. So you would agree with that or disagree? I do. I, I do agree with that. I think it's scale, right? I think you, the, the uh, King William County does have the potential for light scale manufacturing, but it's once again, it's going to be on the scale of 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 square feet. It's going to be the small maker. It's going to be the small support industry business to either a manufacturer somewhere along 95 or along Fort or, or along uh, Fort 95. Uh, and, and it's not necessarily going to be, um, you know, the large producer where they need 100,000 or 200,000 or 300,000 square feet of building space. It's not to say that that can't happen, but what I'm saying is from a, from a what is most likely to happen and where you will likely have the greatest chance of success, yes, it's that light manufacturing, smaller scale, and then having a zoning in there that, that allows that by right and sets very clear policy, I think would benefit the county. I made it <clears throat> on the um, future land use map that Cal, that Cal was showing up there a while ago, the area in orange on 360 between Mill Road and the Firehouse, we have designated that, designated that as a mixed use, and the mixed use could include light industrial. Excellent. So I have a question. We have industrial on the map right now. We're saying that we already have that defined. So are we simply creating a new definition because our buyers are not smart enough to know that the stuff that they can do in industrial can go into there now? Like light industrial can go into industrial right now. Light right? industrial can go into industrial, but light industrial you don't want next to a neighborhood. You want the industrial. Right. But what I'm saying is, is we have zoned industrial. What people are talking about is creating a new definition yes yet we have industrial right now so if i designated industrial i don't need to create a new category i already have that category correct that light industrial fits in most, most, you put, if I'm in this direction, no, go ahead most localities have both light and heavy industrial as two separate categories we we probably would not want to have heavy industrial in a lot of places along 360 and we want to have those certain designated areas. They could be surrounded by light industrial. Um, so, so, so yes, a light industry could 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 uh, could, could park itself in a heavy and just a regular industrial area. But we, we think it's worthwhile. And again, hope hope that Kyle will confirm or or, or deny uh, having additional light industry that could that could be in the same areas as commercial. And the two could be in harmony. We kind of had that already in, in the King William uh, Commerce Park. We actually have some some commercial as well as at least one light industry that folks don't even realize is there because it's so light. So, so uh, yes, I, I I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, I was going to say yes. I, that I do confirm that. I think once you are the the first gentleman is correct. You could put light industrial industrial. That purple area that you see on the map right now is somewhat built out. We don't have a lot of uh, parcels and land left in there, and so. There is potential for future growth in the industrial and, and that right now, at least in this area, based on this future land use map is the only place where it could be. And so it's both. It is, it is um, creating additional spaces where the lighter manufacturing operations can go rather than just that one, because that one, uh, that's where the, um, I believe that's where the Purina, the, the kitty litter plant is and they consume a good bit of it. Um, so it's expanding how much we have available, but. The other point that the second gentleman was making is absolutely true is it creates an opportunity to create a complementary use to commercial development that is also more visually palatable uh, to, you know, being along the, um, the, the your major highways. And the third, which we didn't really talk about, and what I mentioned earlier is you can put, for example, light industrial surrounding the heavier industrial and then create a buffer so that you don't have residential encroaching upon for example, the kitty litter plant, and then people start complaining about the noise or the the hours or the lights or what have or the amount of trucks that go in and out of there, and it helps protect your um, industrial and your and your heavy commercial base. And so it, it's all three of those things. But yes, a light industrial user can go into the industrial zone, um, but we don't want. I wouldn't want to make this, for example, 
if we decided to make this parcel down here, I wouldn't want to make that heavy industrial. I'd rather that be a light industrial where it could be a hybrid commercial, something that is more visually appropriate for the southern entrance into the county, as opposed to a major, for example, manufacturing facility. That, and that would be the purpose of having the two different designations, light and, and, and regular. And I also heard you say that, that just to just be clear, so around the kitten litter plant, all four sides have residential abutting it. And, and you were suggesting that it would be better suited if it were light industrial or ag or something as opposed to residential. Yes, I think, I think that if, it, it, you know, all things being equal, I know there's a couple of developments that abut it that are already done. And so, you know, that would be more of a challenge to change. But yes, you generally want to try and create some separation between those larger users, particularly that have a substantial amount of tr heavy truck traffic uh, coming in and out. Because like I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, sometimes people will move in there after that facility has been operating for decades and then start complaining that it's doing this, it's doing that that you know, the, there's smells and so forth and so on. And, and it creates a challenge. It creates a challenge for your elected officials. It creates a challenge for your community. It makes that business feel unwelcome and, and that could have substantial both economic development and fiscal impacts on the community if either forced or by choice, they choose to leave because we create an opportunity where we have non incompatible, let's put it this way, incompatible uses next to each other. So just to, just to try to, put a, a real fine point on it. Earlier, you showed us a model and, and the, the, the greater the value in the house, the, 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 the more from a, from a cost burden standpoint, the more it, it supports itself, right? So, so, so lower value houses um, uh, don't generate as much uh, tax revenue and, um, and, and, um, at least in the model, require the same level of services. And so if you can push that value of the housing higher, that helps economically. And having housing next to an industrial use does not, it's not accretive to creating value in residential. Yes, I think, I think that is a fair statement to say is uh, residential uses abutting an industrial use will probably have less demand uh, some folks won't want to live in that environment. And so that could have an adverse impact on the value of that property, all things being equal. Great. Actually, I believe statistically, the higher the value of the house, the less the number of children. Okay. Kyle, I have a question. <laughs> yes. Um, initially, I, I felt like it was a contradicting statement, but um, but I, I think I'm seeing a little bit more clear. The, um, the ratio you gave of um, a residential versus non-residential must be in 95 uh, residential. Um, you said the goal is 25 to 35% non-residential, but you said that you felt like we had enough commercial. I think it you mean that we, we just need to take our time with getting to that, that threshold, that 25 to 35%, um, so to not flood the market. Is, is that what you mean? And if so, what would be a, an a estimated timetable on how long it would take us to get to that goal. So forgive me for not being clear. Um, the 95% residential, 5% commercial is total is taxable value. And what I was saying is communities tend to target trying to get to 25% to 30% of their total taxable value being non-residential, not commercial per se, but being non-residential, which includes commercial, which is office and retail, and as well as industrial. And so that's, that would be the target. And so it's, it's not tied directly to commercial per se, but it is for non-residential. So I apologize, I misspoke there. When I said that you have a sufficient amount of land zoned for commercial, that is targeted specifically to that use. Um, and that the 5% the includes the underlying value of the land because it is zoned commercial, even if it's not built upon. And so you would obviously, that ratio would increase if there were buildings physically on that property and then also creating um, either sales tax revenues or um, you know, generating from capital investments, uh, the, the buildings, the, the machinery and tools, that's a, a, that's a fairly substantial revenue stream for the county, not just the physical you know, walls and floors and ceilings, but also the, the machines and tools they use to do their job is, are, is also taxable to the county. And so that's what I meant by, 
you have you you your the amount of land zoned for retail development is greater than what we see you would need in the foreseeable future based on number one the spending potential of your existing residents number two the projected chain growth uh in in new households based on compared to what you already have in place and the the desirability of shopping in other areas that are relatively close by and so that's that those are two different thoughts one is physical amount of land zoned for that partic one particular non-residential use and then trying to balance it out and and by the way to that point and i appreciate you bringing this up so i a, i can provide better clarity but that's also a good reason that i didn't hadn't really thought of is why the light industrial zoning um may be converting and i'm going to go back to that slide converting some of this red to a let's call it a, a lavender right in between the red and the purple uh which would then create opportunities for accelerating development which will create greater non-residential value which would help you move uh closer and faster towards that you know that higher percentage now remember that's a goal it doesn't mean we actually that that every community gets there but that's generally seen as a, a good split between residential and non-residential and from a taxable value perspective so i'm i'm just gonna i'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna rip the band-aid off um so in, <laughs> in 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 the um in the comprehensive plan that, that we reviewed last month, it's it, it, it stated as uh, as summarized in the chart below, the retail leakage analysis indicates that there is significant demand in King William County, right? And 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 um, that's not the case. Well, it, so it, this is the, this is where it gets fuzzy, right? Significant is a qualitative term, okay? It's not a quantitative term. Um, there are tens of millions of dollars of retail sales leaking out of King William County. That is irrefutable. That's what the data shows. The, when I took a look at it and I applied the, if you remember in the analysis I showed had um, the recapture rates because you're not gonna recapture all of that because people are gonna continue to have shopping preferences. They're gonna have particular stores they wanna shop at. They're gonna shop closer to work. They're gonna shop online. And so while you are leaking tens of millions of dollars in, in retail sales, it is not likely and frankly, highly unlikely you're gonna capture all of it. So you do have, you know, someone reasonably could say it's a, a significant amount of, of leakage, but the, from our analysis, it, that doesn't translate into several, the, the enough demand to support several new businesses. What we looked at, what we saw when we did our analysis was you have an opportunity to help existing businesses either expand hours or expand product lines or maybe get a little bit bigger. They go from you know, 5,000 square foot to 6,000 square foot. But the, the, the data didn't really support bringing all new stores to the marketplace because there is a threshold, as we talked about last time, there is a threshold that new stores um, will require in terms of capturable sales that support that square footage before they'll come in. The exam, I, I'll, I'll continue to pick on pharmacies because Speed, I think that might have been one of the first things you said to me when you and I talked all those months ago. Um, is you know a, a, your traditional credit tenant, you know Rite Aid, CVS, Walgreens, um, pharmacy requires between twenty and forty thousand square feet of supportable square footage sales, and that's a lot. Um, and so it, it, you you had, if I remember correctly, and I, I'm don't quote me, you guys have it in your packets, but it was like somewhere between three and 6,000 square feet of supportable square uh, um, sales for supportable square footage in pharmacy. Well, we're way off 20 to 40,000 square feet at you know, three to five or three to 6,000 square feet. And that's the, that's the point. I, I, it, this is not in, by no means a, a, a disparagement of the analysis. I think there are a lot of leakage. There is a, 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 a bit of leakage coming out of the county, but the problem is how much of that can we get back? And then what does that translate to in terms of supportable square footage? And, and if I may, uh, we, we, we gave you all a presentation to the Hill Group and uh, they took a look at it. They confirmed that actually their numbers and yours agree. Uh, they talked about how you all discussed the projected capture of the leakage, which has caused some confusion. So, 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 so you were talking about projected capture. They were not really talking about that, so they're going to clarify that that in the revision. So, so thank you very much for, for helping us with that. So, where sure. where I where I was going with it, Kyle, if you could pull that map back up. So, I, I think that that um, so the the red <clears throat> is is commercial, and and there's some portion of that that's brand new. 
and, and particularly on the south end of 360, I think what you're recommending is we switch from commercial to light industrial. That that um, we could, um, that, that fixes the, the cannibalism that you talked about. That fix that, I mean it fixes a whole bunch of things. It, it's a, it's an option that that we're recommending the county consider from an economic development perspective. Yes. Other questions before I keep moving? But from your presentation, which was very good, it almost seems like we could also right the ship by having bigger houses, not to discriminate against small houses, but you know, less less kids, take better care of it, maybe spend more money locally. Uh, from, from a fiscal perspective, uh, absolutely. From a fiscal perspective, having more valuable homes will have a more positive or at the very least a lesser negative impact to the county's operations. Uh, you know, you, you can't escape the impact that school age children have uh, in terms of cost. Um, to be very clear, for those of you, for, for, for the uh, uh, big brother that is listening, it is illegal to zone out children. <laughs> um, and so uh, you, can, you can do things to try and encourage other types of development, but you can't specific, well, you know, I, I guess, the, the, as I was going to say, the only legal way of doing it is doing age-restricted housing. That is correct. But uh, outside of that, it, it is, you can't say you can't sell a house to someone who has children unless it's covenant. Age-restricted is the only protected uh, class there. So I just want to make sure that that's a, that's, that's a clarity so that you guys, hopefully you don't run that down that rabbit hole. But to the point that was being made, yes. So, so Kyle, uh, um, just to just to launch off of Kenny's good point, right? Which is that it, one of the ways that we can fix air economics, right, is is to focus on increasing the average value of the house of the housing stock in King William, and that correlates to disposable income. And oh, right, can you walk us through how that works? So sure. Thing, before we go down this rabbit hole, if you if you increase your your house value to the projections that were shown up here of going above five hundred thousand dollars, just keep in mind that your population of people who can afford that also diminishes. So you have a diminishing pool of individuals who can afford a nine hundred and seventy eight thousand dollar home, and quite honestly, a nine hundred and seventy eight thousand dollar home in this county, what industry supports that right now? Here. Well, well, so there's a, there's a- We're going with larger homes and, and making this statement out loud. Yes, that does have an impact on I, 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 I didn't say larger. I, I, never, I never talked about the size of houses. What I talked about was increasing the average value of the housing stock in King William was exactly how I stated it. And but, so well, anything we can do to increase the value the average value of our houses, it's gonna help us. It's not, it's not hurtful. Even so, if it's, so to answer, to answer your question, me, yes. If, if we can create a marketplace where individuals who are looking for higher value homes would be willing to pay that in King William County, it would have a positive fiscal impact, all things being equal over a, over a, a lesser value home. The second point that was made, and I apologize, I, I don't know who's saying what, so I, and I, you guys are about one inch by one and a half inch for the entire room. So I can't make anybody out. But to the second point is the desirability of someone who has that kind of disposable income is going to be correlated to access to jobs, access to amenities, access to services, access to uh, retail and shopping. And so the challenge there becomes, it becomes a little bit of a chicken or egg type of situation, right? We want to try and bring in those, those, those households that have greater choice because, you know, there's, they, they can afford, you know, housing in, as we move further into Richmond or as we move further into James City County gets more expensive. Well, they have choice there because they can afford five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred thousand $900,000 for a home. And so then the question becomes, is well, why would you pick here over there? Um, and if that's going to be a life preference thing. I don't want to be in where there's a lot of development, but through our research from market perspective, Generally, the reason why housing values go up is because you have greater conveniences and greater access to jobs, amenities, services, entertainment, recreation. And so that becomes part of it. I think for me, um, 
You know, there the if if we're trying to solve the fiscal dilemma, is the balance of new residential versus new non-residential development that comes to the community, and that once again ties back to I'm not sure that solution is going to be in the retail market sector. That's going to be more in the production based and and the logistics based sectors because the retail sector is dependent upon more people and uh, or it's dependent upon more individuals who can who are going to have higher disposable incomes or at least have more disposable income in the community. And so that those will balance each other out uh, generally over time. And so that's the reason why from if we're purely looking at this from a fiscal perspective, looking at how do we continue to become more proactive and I, I have more recommendations in here to talk through, but how do we become more proactive um, in bringing in those production based businesses, both from creating the spaces that they're looking for, making sure we can improve predictability and consistency so that those businesses will see King William as more attractive. Um, but I do the point the points being made are, are, are all accurate, both from the standpoint of from a fiscal perspective, higher value homes do create better, higher fiscal benefits, but also is how do we get there? And then what does it take to make that happen? And we have to be very strategic because, you know, as you get into those extremely, I would define as high luxury values, um, they do have choice. And we, just like we're, we may not be the most competitive for certain types of businesses, we also may not be competitive for, for certain um, um, and buying, buying groups right now. Kyle, I've, I've started this whole thing, and, and we've had some great dialogue here. You want you want to try to finish your slideshow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um, And so, and so from, so so, I'm sorry. Did someone want to say something? Or I just have some observation, but I can wait until you finish the slide. Okay. okay. So, um, so from an asset development perspective, having more ready to go sites, if you will, shovel ready, pad ready. Um, you know, uh, the potential for speculative buildings. We think this is an area that the county should consider to accelerate the demand, particularly for those production-based businesses. I, as I mentioned earlier, this is, doesn't mean let's activate every single piece of property simultaneously. You need to be strategic about it and focus on one to two sites, one to two, maybe a single shell building at, you know, 20 to 40 to 50,000 square feet of a building through a public-private partnership. Would, would make you more competitive, but also then not create your own competition, if that makes sense. And, and the, the, the linchpin of that is engaging with your property owners, particularly for those key sites and seeing who's ready to pull the trigger, who's ready to make an investment. Um, the point that was made earlier about, we have signs saying for sale, but there's no numbers. This is exactly one of where, that, where the, that fits into our recommendations nicely is, you need to at least have, a, that's the first step, right? If you have a raw piece of land, at least you have to have a price and that price has to be realistic to what the value of a raw piece of land is, reflective of that we need to do the site preparation, get the infrastructure put there, and then physically build the building. If, if I'm, and I'm for the sake of the conversation, if my land is worth 10 grand an acre undeveloped and I'm asking 50 and, and all that work still has to be done, that's gonna be just as detrimental to economic development as not as having too much uh, uh, assets available to you. Um, we talked about, Already, we talked about this, expanding the industrial and potentially light industrial boundaries in Central Garage with the flexibility. I don't need to belabor that anymore. Um, engage your ag community to explore the potential for value add economic development assets. And some examples are a, a meat processing facility or a cannery, the that's the value add. We have the raw materials, we have the animals and we have the, the products, but how do we do the value add where they could be you know, ready for store sales? And so this could be something that we do in, in partnership with the cooperative extension. It's going to require engagement because it's going to more than likely be a public private partnership with those, with those farmers and ranchers. And so uh, it's, but it's an opportunity we think that is out there that we talked about last time we were all together that should be pursued. And then preserve existing production-based clusters through smart land use practices. And we, we already talked about that as well. Um, from an operations perspective, Really one of the biggest observations we have so far is create sufficient funding resources to accomplish these goals. One thing is having full-time staff. The volunteerism in this community is, 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 is um, inarguable, which is fantastic, but that's only gonna get you so far. If you truly wanna move from a reactive position to a proactive position, you're gonna need to have a full-time staff member or multiple full-time staff members to accomplish everything that we want to address. 
Um, you know, initiate comprehensive community engagement to build support. Uh, I, I am not uh, um, naive enough to think that as we talk about higher density, more development, looking at additional industrial, that there are probably uh, uh, segments of your market, of your community that may not be thrilled by that. And so you're going to need to be proactively outreaching to those folks to get them on board, or at least to explain and, under, and allay some of their concerns. Um, stronger collaboration with your neighbors, the region and the state. Um, in the example we give is a more uh, regular meeting schedule. Once you have defined what you want, what you want to be and how you want to be it, and your comp plan shows that you're willing to do it, your partners need to know that that's what's going on, particularly your Go Virginia reach in the state. The more they can understand what you want, what you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it, the more likely they can be an asset to help bring those types of companies to you when, when there's interest. Uh, enhance your virtual economic development presence. And I tell this, it's not just you, it's all my clients. 90% of business site location is done virtually these days. The, the site selectors, the individual businesses are doing their research online. They're going through looking at communities and most communities are eliminated before they're, they ever even know they're being considered. And if you don't have the information they need, everything from the types of businesses you want, the types of incentives that you have, what the cost of land is to be able to advertise an actual dollar amount, not, not call this number to get, a, to get the price. The more information you can have available that someone can find, the more likely you are to be successful in business recruitment. And I, my closing thought on it is all the things we just talked about in terms of opportunities on the last few slides are going to require money and staffing. And so I wish I could, you know, I, I, I have been impressed and in awe of the engagement and energy that Mead has brought to my process uh, from finding me uh, uh, directly to managing this and engaging with me. But once again, as a volunteer, there's only so much that can be done. You, you truly are gonna need additional resources and, and professional staff if you wanna move to that next level. So that's, that's, that was the rest of my presentation. I'm happy to continue to address um, questions or, or comments or observations. Kyle Don Wagner, I'm with the Planning Commission. Um, right now, we have three major developments in the county that are totally residential, uh, several hundred homes in each one of them. No business, no commercial whatsoever. The Planning Commission has proposed uh, a couple of locations for mixed use development. Mixed use being a mixture of housing types, uh, small businesses, even large, larger businesses on the outskirts. Um, partly being uh, probably a traditional, could be a traditional neighborhood development. Just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, I encourage it. I, I think creating mixed use developments, particularly on properties that uh, 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 but 360 and 30, where you can create a mixture of uses, a, a more in or, or a, a little bit higher development density benefits both the commercial market, as well as the residential market, because you're creating walkability, you're creating more sustainability, um, and you're taking advantage of the resource that you have. So in fact, one of the, the comments that I had with Mead earlier today was around, can we look at additional sites, particularly along 360, where we can expand where we offer that mixed use plan unit development zoning um, and try and truly maximize the, the benefit that you have, which is your water sewer system because that's obviously going to be one of the biggest issues of whether you're able to do that is you need to be available to get onto uh, water and sewer and you can't do it through well and septic. And so the fact that that exists here, we would encourage you to look other ways you could do that. And once again, the potential to, uh, what does that mean in terms of being able to reach your additional goals? Because that's, you know, the next steps, the phase two that I mentioned that hopefully we're going to get going on soon is a more detailed real estate market analysis where we start identifying specific sites we think have the greatest potential. Um, it's a more comprehensive fiscal impact analysis where we'll truly dig deeply and make sure we update and give you a more refined response than what we showed you this evening. And then a very fleshed out, you know, this is kind of like, hey, these are some of the things you should be thinking about. Phase two is really where we drive down and start giving you very discrete action steps. And then one of the additional things that we I mentioned earlier today to me was a build out analysis, which is, okay, this is how much we're proposing for mixed use. This is how much we're proposing for medium uh, uh, re uh, density residential. This is how much rural residential. 
what does that yield? How many units can we get out of that? And then what does that mean from an economic development perspective? What does that mean from a fiscal perspective? And so that would be another way to kind of test whether or not you have enough of a specific type of zoning out there to be able to look at it both from, well, all three from a jobs creation, quality of life creation, and a fiscal sustainability perspective. But to answer your question, it's a very long-winded way of answering your question saying, yes, we encourage you to consider uh, that those mixed use areas and also encourage you to look to see where else that would make sense in your community. So if we, to go back to the land use map really quickly, and I just wanted to make sure that I, I captured this. So from my own understanding, you would recommend really thinking about the broader county. Um, I know we spoke very briefly about it at the beginning of your presentation, the idea of doing something um, that's an industrial use on the western edge of the county. Um, from, from just the land use map perspective, <laughs> what do you recommend uh, I guess what would you recommend changing or adding to what is on this future land use map to accommodate that use? So, so in this area, particularly where you show, so what you call rural commercial, are there any sizable tracks that have direct access to 30 um, that could potentially be a, a, a logistics-based business? Now, once again, because there's no water and sewer out there, we're going to have to be careful because you can't put in heavy water users or heavy um, uh, discharge users because there's going to be no way to capture that. But you can look at, from the reason why logistics works here is twofold. One, they generally, it's a handful of individuals that need to use a toilet. And so you could, you could manage that over a larger piece of property. And two, it takes advantage of the locational asset, which is that direct shot to 95 and be able to move goods and services up and down uh, the interstate towards those larger uh, uh, economic activity centers. So just from a designation standpoint, the, potentially the expansion of that rural commercial designation could accommodate that recommendation. That, that's a great question. I don't know. I don't know if it would be better to do it through expanding the rural commercial or if it would be that light industrial where you include, you know, the, the capabilities for warehouse and distribution. Um, I, the, I would have to dig deeper into that. Frankly, Hill Studios probably would be better because they're, they're, they have more experience in those specific issues. But yes, it would either have to be reconstituting uh, what is allowed either by right or through conditional use in rural commercial, the implementation of that light industrial um, or some, some strategy where you, 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 frankly, you can zone it industrial and no one's ever gonna put production out there just because they're never gonna be able to get the water and sewer. It's not gonna be cost feasible to do that. So if that's, that use, those uses are already allowed in industrial, putting that industrial nomenclature out there would, would allow that while not, at no risk of like a heavy manufacturer moving out there. The one thing that I'm trying to reconcile in my own mind, right, is, is, is so when we look at, at, at our county, it makes sense to put that you, the use we're discussing in the, in the western edge on 30, right? It just it makes sense. But every site between you know, the Caroline um, County line and 95, if, if development costs and land costs are the same, is a better site. In, if it's zoned for that, yes. So you would have competition there. And so this, I don't know what the zoning is in Caroline County, to be frank with you. Um, but if, if just for the sake of this conversation, if Caroline zoned every inch of that land between the county line and 95 for warehouse and distribution, they would have a competitive advantage. And so uh, uh, to your point, you would probably want to know what their future land use is for that. But once again, it's also over time that will all become built out. And so then this stretch of 30 would be the next logical location for that. And so maybe it's, maybe this is a 30 year strategy instead of a 10 year strategy, but it, we just wanted to make sure that the county was aware of it from an economic development perspective so that you could, you could make decisions, particularly through your comp planning process of, do you want to earmark some land for that either short, middle you know, or long-term, or do you, you just don't see it or there's gonna to be too much resistance or whatever the reason may be where you don't wanna do that. That's all. But you, you make a valid point, Lee. One more question. This may be more just a general conversation for, for a colleague from the Planning Commission. And I do have to confess that when I look at the future land use map, I, I, I am ignorant of the current land use map. So that I'm trying to, I guess my, my question or where I think a point of conversation based 
based on what we've heard, is what trade offs are we making from agricultural uses or commercial uses to residential uses, and what is the economic trade off of, of adding um, land into a rural residential category or into a medium density residential category? And, and is that the kind of uh, future use that we want to anticipate given? What we've heard tonight with the, the typical value, property values that go into those rural residential and taking an empty residential um, categories and designations and classifications. If, if I may, and, and so for me, the future land use map, it does well for it. In fact, the future land use map is not current zone. What the future land use map is, what the citizens, the EDA planning commission board supervisors all think we should do. When when something comes before me, it's future land use map calls for agriculture and they want to put high density residential. My inclination is to deny it. On the other hand, if the citizens have weighed in, the supervisors and everybody else have weighed in to say yes, we think this is a good place for high density residential, when the when the application comes in, I'm more inclined to recommend approval. Okay, because again, the citizens, board supervisor, everybody said we want to have high density here, we want to have industrial there. So they can continue to keep it as it is. Uh, but, but if they want to do something different, the future land use map helps inform sure, us. Future land use is a, is a guide for us yes. to think about what could be here in the future. Yes. And, and, and I'll add one additional caveat. So if, if, if it's a development that doesn't do much for us, I'm less inclined to change the zoning and recommend approval. However, if it's a wow, big taxes, big jobs, uh, something else, a a a, a, a Eastern and Reichman and Elko with, 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 with their server farms, uh, I think, which we won't get that, of course, but, but something like that that brings in a lot of jobs or a lot of tax revenue, I'd be inclined to modify the future land use map and still accept that type of development. So, so it's just a guide for us. Well, it, 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 it's what we're looking at over the next 20 years, how we want to grow. <clears throat> but we're going to be looking at this every five years, and probably less than that, probably every two to three years, we'll be taking a major look at this. Generally, we try to keep the major development, residential and commercial, in that 360 corridor. Right. Which they're recommending as well. Sure. I, my question is about the residential and, and what we're adding on this map as the as to our guidebook, that we want to put new residential in these places. And my question becomes, if we were to allow this kind of residential development in these places, taking it out of whatever it is now, and adding it to new residential categories, what does that do to our economic gain for the community? Good. I think it's a catch-22 from, from any long standpoint. <clears throat> Here, here's the thing. An important part of the conversation. Here, here's the thing: is that we've got the Nestle Purina plant in West Rock leak a lot of employment to other counties surrounding us. They, most of their employees commute from outside the county, and that indicates to me that there's a lack of of appropriate skill sets within the county for those jobs. Mm -hmm. We want people. I, I drive to Stafford every day. And that's simply because of the job that I do and what this county can actually provide as far as an economic basis. So I drive 90 miles every single day, one way, in order to get to my job. Jay works in Richmond. The thing is, is that we may have the skill sets here, but the thing is, is what's driven a lot of people out of West Rock living in West Point, which was their basis for a very long time, is the fact that taxes. I can live right across the line in New Kent and make the same amount of money in West Rock, but I get hit with taxes if I live here that are more than what I get hit in New Kent. That's a financial obligation that they've got to calculate in. We become the, the job location and New Kent becomes the bedroom community for West Rock. I mean, that's just a fact. So I think this is a true statement, just like thinking this through. So like Food Lion from an economic standpoint doesn't really generate a lot of tax value for us. Generates a lot of jobs, right? But not a whole lot of value. 
And what we're talking about is how do we create value, tax basis value, right, to make this county more solvent, right? We, we, we're, we should be at 25% business, we're at five, right? And, and so we're so lopsided. And so what we're trying to do is fix that equation. So Purina, uh, West Rock, you know, it, it's okay. from, from, from a tax standpoint, if they want to live somewhere else, that, that's, we'd, we'd rather have the business than, than the employment. Sure. <clears throat> but that, that wasn't the statement that was made. The statement was made is we don't have the skill sets to live here. I, I disagree with that. Okay. Well, but the, like the other thing is, is what does that look like when you're when we're talking about increasing it? Because it's a total value. It's not simply ninety five percent of our property is tied up in residential. It's the entire value of that. So when we're looking at the entire value of residential, what would it take? What would we have to add to King William County in order to get us to even fifteen percent? And balance it more. That's what the build out study that he's talked about is. That last Oops. bullet, the last slide, that's what that's what we're talking about doing. Oh, one one important fact there is that we have 12,000 people in the county. We have 8,000 people going outside of the county. But we only have 4,000 jobs available. So so what, what are they going to do? So we've got to bring jobs to the county. Uh, absolutely, one hundred percent agree. And they don't have to be. They can, you know. There, there are a lot of areas that, that I think we're getting a lot of information from Kyle that tells us what areas that we can create those jobs, and a lot of them being high-paid jobs. So, you know. I, I still think it's a catch twenty-two, though, because, and I mean, to your point, people live here, but they work outside the county. Why is that? We need to get to the bottom of it. They're, they're living here regardless of the tax the tax structure. So why are they going outside the county to work? Is there something our businesses here? I guess what I'm saying is that if we're going to bring more businesses here. We need to make sure that we can also make sure that those businesses know that they can hire people to work those jobs. Because if you don't make it enticing for a company to come here, if they're not confident that they're going to be able to bring workers to their to, to their company to work every day, they're not going to they're not going to bring their business here. Right, so. but the majority of businesses that we have added to to King William County over the past six years, the majority of those businesses have been restaurants. They have been low paying jobs. We've added advanced auto. We do not. We are not adding I, I agree, high agree, paying yeah. jobs. West Rock provides thirty three percent of the tax basis for this entire county. Purina is right behind them as the other heavy hitter that is here. It's not necessarily a like high skilled job or anything like that, but it is what that industry is bringing as far as because the majority of what we make from Purina or from um, West Rock is based off of tools and machinery and all of that. We don't get anything off of income. The state gets that. So high paying jobs, while I agree, they're they're not coming here for the jobs because that's what we provide. Most of the people who work here are the ones who live right around here. We're not importing people to work at the Bojangles. I can guarantee you that. Nobody's trying <laughs> to come in and work at Bojangles. They are local to here. If we're going to increase it, then we need to find an industry to, that we can add here that's going to fit. Let me, let me ask Kyle a question before he leaves. Are you still there, Kyle? I'm still here. Um, can you pull up the map again? Sure. Can you see it? Yes. Uh, the one that shows West Point. That one. Look to the northeast, uh, northwest of West Point, the purple area. Mm -hmm. That's along the railroad track and the river. Yep. That's industrial development. <clears throat> that area has access to the water. There is some large activity in that area. It also has access to the railroad and has close access to uh, Route 64. Why aren't we considering that for more uh, light industrial, industrial type development? So the, the real question is, what kind of demand will we have for, for that location? Right? And what's, what are the drivers? And we well, you've got, we, we you've got close access to 64. You've got access to the water. 
uh, and you've also got access to a railroad. But at the upper end of Caroline to that point, Don, the upper end near Caroline, I'm closer to 95 than if I go to West Point and go to 64. Um, yeah, to, to, where, to, where you're, to, yeah. to where you're going. Kyle, yeah. will, you, will you all be identifying sites for us? In phase two, yes. Okay. There, there, there are, are two things that I, I, I just wanted to suggest that, that might fill out our their understanding of how the economics in this county work. One of them is it, it would be an interest. It would be it would be helpful to understand the value of solar. We I mean there's been a lot of discussion about it, but but if, if to really understand what what the from a tax standpoint what the value is, just as a as a point of reference, right? Mm -hmm. And then and the, and the other is what 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 is the value of 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 a field? You know, a piece of farmland. Um, or, or you know, like timber, and and to understand because you 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 were tying that back to to required services, and you know, it'd just be interesting um, to 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 have better insight into that. We, which is uh, that'd be great because we can that when we do the more detailed fiscal impact analysis piece in phase two, which is part of the scope of services, we'll make sure we incorporate those. Great. Okay. So let's see. So we we got a, we got a, still got a full schedule. So um, <laughs> what um, is, 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 is are there any are, are there any more um, um, burning yeah, questions? Like yeah, <laughs> uh, for Kyle and and Kyle, um, if if we if we have uh, additional questions, um, is is um, could can we get those to you? I mean, can we absolutely. So I would I would only ask me that um, you collect whatever additional questions are and send them all over together. Uh, I just want, I just want to make sure I, I, and it's mostly just for the, the, the um, tracking of it to make sure that all of them are um, number one addressed and that, you know, you know, you meaning the County know everything that's being asked. So uh, if someone says something, send something directly to me, I'm going to forward it to you anyway, just to make sure that there's a trail paper trail. But yeah, so I'd say if, if you have additional questions or you're driving home, or you're brushing your teeth tonight before you go to bed, and you're like, "Oh man, I wish I would have asked this question." Um, get that to Mead, and then Mead, if you want to give them a time in which to try and get that to you, to me, so that I can have time to respond to it and make sure that it's incorporated in our in our phase one narrative. That's great. Thank you. So we'll we'll, we'll figure that out. And uh, is, there, is there anything else? Nothing else. Thank you so much. This was very helpful. Yeah, Kyle. Well, thank you very much. Have a great night, everybody. You too. Okay. Uh, and so let's see, I, I, um, 5B is overall comprehensive plan discussion. And so I, um, I, I guess you all get to grab that one. Uh, no, we want to hear what you got to say. Well, <laughs> if, 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 if I may. So um, I have to just raise you on one thing. Uh, Dr. Wagner said that every five years we would update it. We will be looking at pieces of the comp plan every year. Okay. Yeah. And, and we're obligated every five years. Well, yes, we're obligated every five years, but we're going to be looking at some every year. And in point of fact, as, as you all get additional information, as you all identify particular tracks that are, are attractive to one thing or another, bring them to our attention. We can uh, update the future land use map. Uh, we can even look to, to do the rezoning in advance and so forth and so on. So I would, I would ask you as you go yeah. forward to, to, as you see things that, that should be different, uh, let us know. However, we are close to recommending approval of this one, so the better we can get it now, the better off we are. Um, I, I had gotten you all the, the very, very small map a couple of months ago. I wanted to get you all thinking about this sort of thing. What changes do you all want to see to the future land use map in particular? What changes do you want to see to the comp plan in general, uh, including, for example, in the goals E3, uh, there's some economic development stuff, and some of which I think we're doing one of our goals and strategies you're already doing. Are there other things that should be in the comp plan? So again, you know, uh, we, we were able to hear uh, this presentation together. I think we, we've come to a lot of agreement probably on some changes we want to have, but, but, but like, like Mr. Wagner said, we're interested in what you all want to see with the comp plan and any changes. So let's just have a huddle. What's the best way to do that? Should, should we circulate uh, uh, something? And um, if we have comments, uh, um, should we set up a little steering committee? Set somebody to, to run, run there, the on this? Or how do you all want to do this? The one thing we've always back and forth with.
was that light industrial. That was something that maybe wasn't looked at or is, is brought into the fold. So I think that that could be pretty important to kind of resurface. How much, if any, changes have done that affect the fact what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, tomorrow we'll be hearing from the citizens as a whole. Um, they, uh, this is their chance to tell us what their concerns are. Um, I'm better, I'm personally better informed. I think the entire planning commission is at, at, as to some of the changes we might want to make. Uh, but but tomorrow is the time for the citizens to weigh in. Uh, I, I think it, it sounds like to me that we have to add a light industrial to the to the uh, to the zoning subdivision ordinance. Uh, once we've done that, then then identify those places that should be light industrial slash commercial. Um, one thing he talked about was was actually we have one place, for example, uh, as you have thirty or have three sixty, there is high density residential with 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 with, with, with uh, low density residential in the middle there. And what I heard him say was to to crunch more folks into a smaller area closer to businesses. I heard the same thing. Um, what changes would you all like to see in the comp plan? And, and we're getting close to the end in that the citizens will have their meeting tomorrow to voice their concerns, their recommendations, their likes, their dislikes. The planning commission will take what we've heard, heard tonight, we'll be here tomorrow, look at the final draft. And at that point, we'll be ready to go to the public hearing probably in June or May. I think May. Yeah, uh, at the earliest May and at the latest June. So there's still a little more time, but it's not, there's not more months, which doesn't mean to say that we can't, the week after it's approved, begin to catch things that we made mistakes on, which we, we did with these zoning subdivision ordinance. I think, you know, from the Hill Group study, they talked a lot about landscaping. And I know, like, whenever light industrial, as I travel to my business, you know, like North Carolina field does well, Maryland does well. There's great buffers of landscaping. And we have lack of like, none. Really around new development. I don't understand new development's young, so the trees still have to grow. Well, and, and we didn't have those sorts of standards, but with the, with the zoning subdivision ordinance adopted last fall, we have a lot more of that. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in the transportation corridor. Yes, especially in the transportation corridor along 360 and Route 30. Just from, the, from, an, just from an economic development standpoint, and looking at the treatment of economics in the complex. It is very, very focused on retail. And my conclusion from everything we've heard from Kyle and everything that we seem to kind of generally know and understand is that retail is not the immediate near term or medium term driver of, of, of growth. Of the we have to be more focused on industrial uses, whether light or heavy. Um, if we're going to be successful on that, uh, uh, we're trying to find a way that, that acknowledges the limitation of, I think, I, I say limitation, I'm not trying to speak negatively of anybody, but the Hill Studies approach is trying to get leakage, we're trying to speak for things that ultimately are not what's going to be the game changer for people. And I think trying to figure out a way to at least Acknowledge that within the narrative of the comprehensive plan report. Because when we read this, it reads to me like we think our future is in a bunch of us. And, and I think everything that we know is that, that it's just not going to help us get to where we need to be. Um, and then I think the, the goals I think are, are, are terrific. I think to your point, um, you know, this study itself is accomplishing one of those goals. So I think that's terrific. Um, from a from a land map perspective, I guess I would just come back to I don't know that I have enough information right now to really uh, I would want to have a better understanding of what adding all of those residential classifications does just from a dollars and cents perspective when it comes to taking land out of an agricultural use or out of another use for into the residential use. And I'm not sure that if we have a enough information right now to say whether or not that really is a good idea to make a solid recommendation about whether or not that's something that we really should do. We're, we're going to get some more insight when Chris Couch talks. He's done, he went deeper than the uh, uh, um, I mean, 
whether 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 it's nine hundred thousand dollar houses or a hundred thousand dollars. In the next few weeks, if you can get any comments from this grant, that would be fantastic. So let's see. Uh, you've been sitting there quiet, and, and you, you you study you study their built environment. Did, did, did you have any observations? No. Uh, it, uh, it's okay. All right. Um, you know, we we talked to you about like kind of the bell ringers and the things that really pay you taxes. If you were to take, um, I was in Carmax a couple months ago, and they post the taxes that they pay. This is the one by Glen Allen. And they do 30 million in full sale automotive and 136 million through the front door. So they pay in right to $309,000. That's not property taxes. That's not machinery and tools. I mean, we're not going to have a car max here, but like if Joe's plumbing, I don't know if he's a Joe's plumber, so my apologies if you do. If he does 300000 in sales, he'll pay about $600 in people. So it, so let's connect that back to what we're talking about. So that's that's retail, and so CarMax generated three hundred thousand dollars. Three hundred. What was it? Uh, Thirty million in wholesale. So that's when they buy. Yeah, any but car. what do they generate in tax? Oh, uh, three hundred nine thousand. Three hundred nine thousand. A CarMax. All those automobiles, right? And so when you think about a food line, right? That's re it, retail is not going to fix us. Let me collect one thing. Food line is one of the top ten. Uh, tax uh, revenue in the county. It pales in comparison. To I, yeah, I, I, it's not. I, I agree. It pales in comparison, but for what we've got in the county, right. it is more. Still, that's one of the necessary evils we got. To yeah, absolutely. We can't that's have a that said more the fact that we don't have enough industrial. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm, yes. does, you know. well, we, we've got two good industries in the county, and, and I, I think anybody would welcome more industry, clean industry in the county. Well, <clears throat> and it will bring in more revenue. So, so I, 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 you know, yeah, I just, I just want to make sure that I've, I've, I've said food line three times tonight. Food, what, where, where food line really, what, what food line brings is jobs, right? So it's not that they definitely add value, it's just, it's just not our tax base, which is what. The conversation was about. Well, we we have, as, as uh, Jay said, we we pretty much concentrated around trying to bring in yeah. uh, more business and, and less residential. Yeah. Not less residential, but if we're going to have the residential coming in here, we want complementary business, and most of that business is going to be commercial. But yes, I, I totally agree that we need to look at uh, industrial. How light about the, the recommendation on looking into a, like a cannery or a, or a processing plant? That's the type of jobs right. that we need right there. And, and they're going to have the, I mean, the, the equipment that they're going to require. Um, you're right. right. All of that is going to fall, right? And we've got, I mean, <clears throat> this industrial area right here, and as the Purina has, they, they've got space in there that something like that could go and it would not, you know, they're not. Affect anything in this 360 corridor. Um, it it could possibly go in that eastern part of the county near West Point, possibly. And I think I'm, and that's so right. Yeah. Uh, so if we, I mean, and look at the agriculture around us and the in the um, the farming that's in the the, 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 the ranch style farming. The um, <clears throat> there's there's a lot of opportunity there, and not just in King William. Uh, they have, I think. I recall correctly, there's a cannery in I think Farmville that allows people to come in, you know, just your hobbyists and, and so forth, that they come in, and people are able to come in and bring their all their you know blackberries and blueberries and everything, and they will make them into we don't look at that. Uh, yeah, but, but, but they yeah. well, but they yeah. had but they had to travel the, the company well, that I mean they didn't have to travel to Farmville because the closest location. location they had. Out of everybody in the northern neck that does that type of farming, they could come to King William to right. And so now we're drawing from other counties. I, you're spot on, right? And we're and we're and we're levering the, the assets we already have, which is ag. I mean, we already grow vegetables here, right? right? And and so it just yes, I just it you just still had a lot right. of discussion apparently at your last yeah. meeting on yeah. um, agricultural type development, and I think. I think we need to concentrate on that. There are so many possibilities out there. Uh, 
orchards, wineries, uh, uh, nurseries, uh, so many things out there that could be bought. And then they, they would also include bringing in tourism to the county. Because if you can get uh, a farmer's market, a good farmer's market, uh, feature products we grow and develop here in the county in the farmer's market, it's going to bring people in here for that. I'd like to see the economic impact of those types of things because I don't know, isn't there a lot of tax breaks for people that, that do the, the agritourism? You do. you do get a lot of tax breaks, but, um, but, it, but, but the, the thing is it brings people brings to people the county so and helps tourism. Other, in other ways as well. But. Okay. And one thing, one other thing I'll throw out, um, looking at the mixed use development, one of the things that uh, we've talked a lot about, or has been talked a lot about, is uh, recreation. Uh, part of that mixed use development, one uh, near 360, could be uh, uh, regional sports complex. And as a part of the larger development, the developer could uh, encourage or bring in a regional sport complex, which would uh, increase the number of uh, restaurant trips, uh, overnight stays, things like that, and bring in a lot of people from from the northern neck, uh, um, northern neck in uh, our, <laughs> our district, uh, Middlesex, Matthews, uh, all those counties could bring those into them to a regional sports park. Uh, so I think that's one thing that okay. we might want to keep in mind. All right. Um, thank you. Um, all right. So we've got Chris Couch is, is up. And, and Chris, Chris uh, Kyle said that he, he um, uh, recognized that Chris's uh, presentation goes, goes a little bit deeper. Chris is pretty thorough uh, in his analysis. And uh, Chris, maybe you can teach yeah. us something about that. Um, I think that I think the biggest difference, um, there was a lot of overlap. Probably the biggest difference is minus three, like a thousand points. <laughs> but uh, they keep going to a little more detail. Uh, I, I, can, I think I can project. Oh, all right. So um, we're pulling the presentation up here. And man, this, this, this thing has been around for a little bit. Uh, if we go ahead and get to the first slide, and really it's just some background. Some of the view, uh, Apologize, Mr. Greenwood. I know you've heard this one before, but uh, uh, I think there was one slide before that just to kind of talk about how we got here. Chris, um, you want to tell us about you? Well, that was going to be the second part. Okay. Um, we'll go back the other way. I guess not. Anyway, um, how we got here, first of all, a couple of years ago, earlier last year when we were doing the zoning ordinance updates, there's a lot of talk about the five to 10 acre. Um, uh, change in, in agricultural districts and, and a lot of residential development there. And that led to, uh, me and Ms. Marin asked a number of the other consultants that were around here, hey, can we model this out? What is the impact of, of new houses on our county? And um, didn't really get any bites on that. And I kind of reached out to Ed and said, hey, let's let's knock some ideas around. And, and I've done a lot of modeling in my previous career. Um, and so that's how we got to this point. Also a bit about, you know, kind of the, the history that I'd seen in King William, where we were developing and building a lot of houses, not necessarily doing a lot of commercial and industrial development. So it's really good to hear the conversation just now. A bit about me, since some of you may or may not know, a lot of you might think of me as a salad maker. I've been referred to that. But uh, prior to the current business that I run here in the, in the county, I spent up two decades in the Fortune 500 uh, management consulting space. I did... Uh, a lot of strategy work, a lot of large scale transformation work. I traveled a lot. Even when I lived here in King William, I traveled all around the globe, spent about three years in Australia, helping them, uh, helping at Telstra, which was the telecommunications giant there, transform their entire operational and business support systems from power based networks to IT based networks. I was part of that executive team there. And um, just as a consultant, you get to see a lot of different things uh, and experience a lot of different opportunities. Did that for a while, uh, about 15 years, and then uh, got plucked and went to uh, Primatics, which was a uh, financial services company. Uh, I got pulled there where they had built a software package to help banks that had acquired distressed assets uh, manage the highly complex financial and um, accounting and financial 
uh, valuation services. And so I was pulled there to help them start their services business. And uh, we, in the result of that, it was a Carlisle Group company. Uh, we may know that, that, that name, but uh, we managed about a trillion dollars in assets for banks. And so highly regulated, highly financial services uh, based. And then I uh, got tired of that, the small startup business, and then went to Xerox and there I was a vice president for three years. I spent uh, a lot of time getting sent into all of the uh, underperforming accounts and helping us understand why they were underperforming and helping the client understand why they were underperforming and restructuring and renegotiating all those contracts. Got tired of the business world, was living here in King William. I said, I want to do something with the farm I already had. And so I started what uh, at the time I think was a pretty innovative idea. Um, it's a farm where we grow produce. We also work with other local farmers. Uh, we have a sustainable agriculture uh, component to that. So we have greenhouses, uh, we grow tomatoes, peppers, and herbs. And uh, each week well, we have a food manufacturing business as well, regulated by VDAX. So each week we manufacture salads and then deliver them directly to the customers. As that business has grown, last year we averaged about 500 salads a week to over 350 customers from West Point to Ashland to Wyndham, the Short Pump, the Forest Hill, Mechanicsville, and that entire area. Um, the only person that I know, that we're the only company that's doing that in, in, in the country, actually. So it's um, it's pretty cool, and uh, we're enjoying it. Keeps us busy. That's a bit about me, um, because I'm a little bit more than a salad maker. So our objective here was to really look at what is the impact of new houses that are being built in our county. And we took an approach, this is a top-down approach, right? So we are not, we want to establish some baseline metrics. We want to look at our revenues, look at our expenses, um, and then kind of model that out as we think about what's the value of, because let's be honest, I think there are a lot of people that see a vacant lot of land and think, wow, if we build a house there, we'll be able to tax that and we'll get more money for our county. And that is, a, that, is a, that is a belief that I think a lot of people have that isn't necessarily true. And we want to try to prove that out and show with real King William numbers um, what that impact might be. This is indicative. It is a top-down approach. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, the pushback that we've received has been somebody trying to pick a very specific assumption and challenge that. It's an assumption-based model. All the assumptions can be changed and we can see dynamically how they, how, what that impact, how that impact changes. Um, and, and the last point there is, even if it's off by 15, 20, 30, 40, 50%, the results are still meaningful, right? So what we wanna do is this is, a, this is an approach that I've used a lot to help trigger dialogue and trigger that discussion uh, so that we understand some of those drivers and what that impact might be. So in scope and out of scope, what, what I did was take 2020 CAFR data. Um, so I wanted to look at as much actual data as we had. What is CAFR? Is the Certified Annual Financial Results, something to that effect. It's the equivalent of, the, of an annual report for, for a county. Um, so we pulled some specific information from there. Number of residents, school enrollment, total or in, in expenses. Um, we also assume, hey, what's as that house, I wish we had that first slide because it really did uh, help to summarize some things. Um, when that new house is built on a vacant lot of land, we're going to be incurring expenses, but we're also going to be generating revenue. And so we're going to model that out. And then there's a lot of where, where we get some pushback is on some of these assumptions that we had down at the bottom around children per house, which is and around vehicles per vehicles per house. And both of those are national data statistics that I pulled. Uh, the one thing I will say, children per house, 1.93, that is the number of children or households that have children. So that doesn't include households that don't have children. And so that is, that's one difference you heard between Kyle's numbers and my numbers. I think they both flip to about the same uh, end result if, if, we, if we equalize those two assumptions there. Um, what is not included? Infrastructure, right? So some of these improvements that would need to be made to support um, growth being 
residential growth, industrial growth, commercial growth, um, were none of that's included, right? So we're just baselining that and we're assuming that away. Um, additional education funding from the state. So you'll see in the education expenses, we're just assuming the portion that King William contributes to, to the budget. Um, very relevant to this discussion, offsetting impact of business and industrial growth. A big part of one of my objectives in this was to show that where we are growing residentially, we need to offset that impact with the business and the industry uh, growth. Cost of living, inflation, that's not included. Demographics of the, of the residents are not included as well. So again, we try to keep it as simple. We try to assume away everything else, keep it pretty straightforward and, uh, and go from there. Sure. Correct. The the what the difference between Kyle's presentation, I think he was at point seven something. So and again, these are national statistics. We don't have King William statistics. And we also don't have a view of you know, we, we have 6,000 parcel or households in this county, and there's 2,000 students that go to the school, the school now. Um, you can't take the parcels that have been built from the beginning of time and compare it to a point in time, which some people have tried to do, right? Um, to, I think to answer your question, though, the 1.93 is for children, average number of children for households that have children. The number of households that actually have children, I believe, is about uh, 40%. So that's where you get to the 0.7 um, if you're looking at all houses. Of those, how many of those, well, what percentage of those uh, children are school age? Uh, well, uh, it, the assumption is it's 18 and under. So, and again, these are national stats. And, and so one of the things that we don't know is new houses are being built in King William. What is the profile of that, how that house is being filled? Is it being filled with the family? Is it being filled with somebody that's retired that's new. not gonna have children? New that houses, new the houses that we add, right. You can't necessarily take King William's existing demographic and apply it to a new house. So what are you considering as new, new houses? So, so right, and so we'll walk through that. It's, it's all assumption driven, right? And so. I did assume 1.93. I assume two adults, two children, right? And, and we'll see what that impact is. So if that's a good kind of segue, well, let's go through some of this just analysis of, hey, let's look at what King William has looked like over the last 10 years. Um, so this is, I looked at revenue. This is the revenue slide, right? Pretty simple observations that it's grown over time. Um, sales and use tax. Had a significant increase in 2020. We believe that was, uh, where is that one? Uh, uh, oh, there we go. Yeah. So you see that big, huge, that big spike between 19 and 20. We believe that's related to two different things pandemic, more people were spending locally. The second thing is online sales started to be taxed. Um, and we, we got some pull through on that. Um, one of the concerns that I had when I looked at that is, as our number of residents increased, the actual business license revenue decreased, right? So this is, um, oh, it's over here, business license. So, so a lot of what I was looking at was boiling everything down to a per resident metric, right? And so this is, this is taking the total number of, the total business license revenue and the number of residents and looking at it year over year, and you can see how it's gone up and actually the last couple of years has gone down. One explanation we had for that was um, this spike here was due to the taxpayer funded school improvements. So we required subcontractors to have business licenses. So and that's concerning to me that the only time we see an increase in business is when we're funding it ourselves. All right. Um, what else? That is probably good for the revenue. Any questions on that? I mean, what was the increase also occurred in 2012 to 13? Yeah. Same yeah. I mean, I really wish we knew some of these answers. All right. 
all I'm doing is presenting. This was kind of how they, what the data told us. We don't know why. And that's a concern for some of us here. Was, so the expenses, this work is really interesting, especially when you look at the expense category per resident. So again, as our number of residents has increased, one of the things as a business owner myself, I expect that as I scale up, that my unit cost goes down. So I can, you know, the, the point I think Kyle made was you can add more businesses. You don't need any more county uh, um, administrators. Well, we're not seeing that in any of these numbers, right? So we're seeing that general government administration per resident, again, is going up over in the last few years. Same thing on public safety. Add more resources. It costs more. Uh, add more, more residents. It's costing more to serve each individual resident. No scalability whatsoever. The you know, the, the elephant room, of course, education is always our biggest expense. Uh, but you actually have seen that education per student, so that the education is then looked at on a per student basis. Um, so our key data takeaways that we're going to use on the next slide are operational government cost, excluding ed education per resident is a little over $1,000. So every resident is costing the county's operational budget a little bit over $1,000 per year. Education cost per student is costing us a little bit under 8,000. So our total King William government operation, or government cost per resident is about $2,000. This is still assuming the 1.9. This has nothing to do with 1.93. This is actuals. So this is the actual number of Residents that we have, the actual number of students that we have, and our actual expense over the last 10 years. Uh, these are, yeah, based on 2020 CAFR. Mm -hmm. So our 17,000 residents that we have in our King William, does that include the school native children or not? Then the answer is yes. Because I'd like to see a more complete, with this, a more complete assessment of what the actual cost is. Yeah, right. For the actual adults who are paying those costs. Mm -hmm. because for, I don't have five year olds paying nine hundred and seventy three dollars for good them, themselves to yeah. the school. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that would drive the the cost the cost, cost, of cost up. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right? Correct. It would. So this is, this is, this is it would make by, it oh, would make this even more conservative. There's a lot of cons conservation built into this model. That's why whenever I'm questioning some of these assumptions, I kind of laugh because I can get you. On, uh, I know there's other ways that, that, that it comes back to you. Um, and again, this is just to spur this exact kind of dialogue so that we understand how all this works and understand what happens as we add new residents, new children, new homes to our county. It's a good data point, too. Okay. So this was kind of the, as you get started, trying to pull some numbers to, to, to do the analysis, just some, some observations that we had on both revenue and expenses. Okay, so next slide, please. So then what we're going to do is start looking at a single house. Now, this is, this is a busy slide, I understand, and, and there's a couple other scenarios that we did. And this is all, this is just a screenshot of an Excel you know, spreadsheet, right? And it's all formatted the same way. So on our left-hand side, we're going to have drivers and assumptions. Everything that's in that box can be changed and it automatically calculates everything on the right-hand side. So if we look at some of these assumptions that we're using in this, this is a single house, right? So it doesn't really matter the 0.73, you 
you know, on average across all houses and how many children are in each house, we're looking at one house. Let's, let's, just, let's just pull some assumptions on what one house looks like. This one house that we are going to assume is sits on five acres of land and that we're going to put a house that is actually assessed at the house is assessed at $244,000 and the property is assessed at 56 to get you to a nice round, even $300,000. Um, one of the other conservation or, or conservative factors to this model is that house that's fair market valued at $300,000 today is not getting assessed at $300,000 today because our assessed values are so far off from market value, right? So that's going to create a bigger difference over here um, because the gap, and, and I, that was just something that we didn't factor in uh, when we first modeled this. Um, Again, values per acre, all this is standard stuff. In this scenario, in this one scenario about this one house, we did use the national benchmark of 1.93 students, children that are going to attend school. And we assumed 1.88 vehicles are going to be parked at that, at that house. Um, and that we assumed an average of vehicle assessed value of $25,000. And what else? Uh, one of the things I don't think I pointed out on the, the revenue side was sales and use tax. But I, I did. It was, it was how it had grown last year. So each resident is driving $92 in um, annual sales and use tax. Uh, some of the data that we pulled from the governmental costs, government costs per resident, education costs per student. Um, I actually... Yeah, it's the same. I built some scenarios in there where we could actually change that if you'd like. So then on the right-hand side, what we see is our new parcel. Again, it's assessed at $300,000. So the revenue that's going to be generated from that is real estate revenue of $2,500, personal property uh, revenue of $1,700, license tax, direct sales and use. This house is $300,000 house with two adults, Two children, 1.93 children, is going to generate $4,537 in tax revenue for the county. It's great because if it was just a vacant lot of land, it was only going to generate $86. Right. So that is kind of the basic assumption I think a lot of people have is that, oh, the vacant land isn't generating taxes, the house is. The flip side of that is the residential government costs, the services and the education that's required to support that household. And so we have residential costs, we have education costs, $14,000. Our total cost is now $17,000. So we've added that house, that house is generating $4,500 in revenue, but it's costing the county an incremental $17,000 to support that household. But our CAFR doesn't either. Well, but here's the thing though. When I'm looking at total cost of what an education costs per student, I must take that into account because the, the county is not on tap to pay that 7690 That may be your average going across the board. They may be on tap to pay 4600 out of that because the state and the federal government also have a certain percentage that they must apply to that um, calculus also. So when you're looking at this, you need to keep that in mind also. Because this is because all of this money doesn't right. just come from the county. Agreed. That's why on the assumptions of our scope was the state funding for education. We looked at we're going to assume that, and we're also going to assume that the school budget is going to remain the same as it was last year on a per student basis. Right, and I get that you're counting that out, but we can't say that the education cost is that. I would be more apt to agree the new residential government cost is accurate, but the education cost is the one that I have an issue with, simply because we have outsourced those other things and not accounted for that funding. Well, so let's go back, if you can, to the um, expense slide, Chris, which is back to me. This one, right? perfect. So in 2020, we, and I don't know the numbers behind this, 
but this was the King William County operational budget contribution to education divided by the number of students in the system. Right, so King William taxpayers contributed $7,690 per student. Right? And so all we're doing here is we're assuming let's add two more students. And let's assume that that number stays the same. I still think that 1.93, you don't said earlier that the 1.93 is any child 18 and younger. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't. Have okay, so let's assume, let's assume this scenario again. Like, you cannot get hung up on a very specific assumption. That's an important input what? number that you're, you're, you're multiplying the number by two to get the total education cost by 1.93. Yeah. yeah. So, if right. that number in reality is closer to one, it's, then now, now you've almost reduced that by half on education. But is it also. positive or negative still? Yes, the premise I agree with. That's the premise that we're trying to prove. That, that, that is the premise. Right? And again, you're right. We can argue, is it 1.93, is it 0.77, is it 0 0.4, 0 0.3? It, it's got to be a very, very low number next to zero in order for this scenario for a residential house to pay for itself. Thank you, Brian. In September of last year, that wasn't a true state. Yeah, it's minus education. Uh, no, I think uh, if we go to that next slide, it should just be the 2086. Um, so, we're do so 2086 is the wrong number. It's the 1,112, which is government expense minus education um, divided by total population. So, so it's, it's this number times two. It's the 1,192 times two. Uh, I'm the one causing that problem. Correct. Yep. And the 1.93, again, just an assumption, uh, times the education cost goes to your 14. And so, again, this is a single house, single scenario um, to kind of to view. Now, a couple of, again, a couple of things that have come up since this was originally created and presented Chris, for free. Can I just say this back so that so when, when you mm -hmm. say the education cost is 14000 you're not saying that's the total cost of education. You're saying that's what King William contributes. Correct. Just so we're clear. Based on the assumption of cost per student, and if that holds the same, is not correct. Okay. So straight out of King William's operating budget. Okay. So a couple of things that are that, that, that have caused some or, or had, had had some discussion on since this was originally created. You know, again, first of all. $300,000 for building a house, fair market value, maybe 300. We're actually, based on the situation that we're in now, only going to assess that at about 160, something like that, right? Because of how far off our assessed values are from fair market values. Uh, so that's gonna drive the tax revenue down, making this more conservative. The other observation again is 1.93, is that the right assumption to be making? Again, this is a single house, so we've assumed a national average. We've assumed it's a family that's moving into this house and that family is gonna bring the national average of 1.9, 1.93 students. Or a 55 and over commuting is built. Does that kind of be Yes. And if it's yeah. positive, and if it's one of these charter communities like in Pareto or Chesterfield, where you have these five hundred thousand dollar houses in the winter in Florida, mm -hmm. Yeah. Really good. Like it, well, it's still, it's still really yeah. Because even if it's good point. Over my house value still has to be enough because yeah. that education cost is shared throughout the entire community. So while you may not be adding to it, if I'm already in a deficit, 
just because I add a 55 and over community does not mean that I'm making bankroll. Back. Right. Because I'm making up the deficit that is already there. But like every budget, you have to have those people to pay for the other people. Well, sure. Oh, no. That's with any aging community. So any aging community, as this county grows older, the kids get older, they move out, they're no longer part of the school. So you have that same thing occur without having a 55 and older community. In the 55 and older community may actually drive a, a, a higher services cost. Right? A 55 and older community may drive a higher services cost with, with yeah. EMS and things like that, right? You know, and, yeah. Right. All of that's got to be right calculated. Yeah. So this is for one of them. What, what, what are right. Great segue. So if you would go to the next slide, please. <laughs> uh, it's been a while. So then we started to say different scenarios. And so what you see here is the exact same layout. Um, and again, this was a lot of this was some legacy stuff around the, the agricultural um, subdivisions and stuff like that. Uh, but I, what I did is you, the main thing that changes as you go through from scenario one to two to three to four is the value is the, the number of acres, which is kind of irrelevant here, honestly and the uh, improvement value. And I've also assumed as that house improvement value goes up, so does the vehicle assessed value. So you're driving, a, you're living in a bigger house, you're driving a better car. And scenario four is where's our break even point. And again, all of these scenarios are based on that same 1.93. Again, so we can change all that and it does change the numbers, but it's always gonna be negative. I think I think the break even based on all these assumptions on the on the students was 0.15. Um, students, students per house. So anything above zero. Students per house of people that have children. No, just so so again, these are all just one house. Just one house. All right. So so what is one house with this demographic with, with this this makeup? Uh, what does it look like? So the, the, this first house is a $225,000 assessed house with 1.93 students in it. Scenario two is a $325,000 house with 1.93 students in it. Scenario three is a $375,000 house with 1.93 students in it. And scenario four is a $1.6 million house with 1.93 students. And there's where you get to your break even. So, all right, bring this back to reality in King William is the average house cost is in King William. Right now, at a value yeah. yeah. 175 yeah. yeah, it's good. Safe. Somewhere around there. Is there any house that is currently assessed in King William at $1.6 million? I'm sure there are. Yeah. yeah. Sure. There are. It's not that nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got the $40,000 truck. That's all I've got. <laughs> yeah, right. So, yeah. Well, because I'm asking, right. because a so you've got up here 25 acres for the new parcel, right? So if I've got 25 acres, because your parcel is going yeah. to, so, and I, here's where I'm asking, what's the average land parcel that we have in King William, along with the average value of the home? Because that brings it back to what the truth is for us, the truth mm -hmm. that this is all great as far as yes. scenarios, but I would, if we've got a $1.6 million house in, in King William, outstanding, but I would doubt that they're few and far between. Mm -hmm. but I think I, from a planning perspective, it's instructive to know that if we're going to convert from an agricultural use to a residential, the plan for the assessed value of those homes is $1.6 Sure. In order for us to if they're going to have 1.3 students at, and they're going to have, drive this dollar value car, there's a lot of other students. Correct. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yeah. Based on these assumptions. Right, so it's lower than anything I have on here. What, 
have you have you taken out all of the the children aspect and and seen what that number is with removing that yeah. um, positive at that point uh, when you remove the children out. If you take the children out, yeah. so it will become positive. From a planning perspective, then if you do this whole report and, and were to you know take the the ratio of people without kids in school versus people that did have the kids in school. I'd like to see how far in the red we are once you overlay the two uh, together, and oh, then, yeah. and then we, what we can do is, uh, you know, if we're looking at say a, a 55 and older community, can we use that to help offset the, mm -hmm. any new residential, especially the, the more dense residential that we have already planned? The hardest part for all for, for me and all this, and the most frustrating part is we really I don't think we know what the profile is of these new homes that are being built. You know, I, I mean, in my salad maker hat, I, I go to a lot of them and I deliver salads to them and I see a lot of kids. I see a lot of toys out. Right. Now, does that mean that they're homeschooling or they're just not of school age yet? I don't know. Um, well, and you're also probably not validating whether or not that individual is raining. Right. And is a and I've also seen a lot of turnover in some of these newer homes too. You know, two years go by and a new person moves in with so the what, child. So what I might suggest is that is that um, uh, ju just as Kyle in indicated earlier, I mean, we're all volunteers, right? Chris has done this it, it just to try to get a better understanding of, of what really is happening and it, w w with their with their tax base, and so. While this may not be precisely accurate in any one category, directionally it's correct, and that's the that's the point. Directionally, this is correct, and and it's useful information if we choose to use it. Right. Well, I'm not saying it's not useful, but the yeah. argument here is to is to focus on yeah. the light industrial instead yeah. of going Absolutely. forward. Right. Well, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. So. Economic development. How long have we heard now, Jay? We want a pharmacy. Yeah. So in order to bring in a pharmacy, we need rooftops. In order to have rooftops, I need residential. In order to have increased retail, where people are now complaining about the food line being short of food in both locations, West Point and Aylet, in order to bring in another Kroger, because there are people who believe, let's just go talk to Kroger and they'll build one. And we'll have a Kroger in King William now. In order to do that, we have to have rooftops. So the balance becomes of explaining this of how do you have growth that also is going to allow us to grow the industrial because we're not going to be able to cut out residents coming in because we don't grow. That. Yeah, it, you can't stop it. Yeah. It's going to. Ha it's happening. It's happening. This is the only way that we're growing in King William. And, and I think you've got a valid argument for why we need to look at the majority of the land or at least a percentage of the land going to industrial and why it should be set aside. Mm -hmm. I, I pick up on your point is that this is the only way we're growing in the world, but we're letting this happen. You can't stop it. Well, why not? You, you can't stop development. Why not? You can't. I mean, there's you, plenty of commission can tell us about it, right? I mean, you can slow it down. You can does have a minimum, minimum lot size of 10 acres in the agricultural there, area. There are choices that we're making about when we can, I mean, back to the previous slide. I mean, I think that this will make from a macro analysis, but on an individual lot standpoint, the conversion of that mm -hmm. parcel, that five, five acres, acres, from an ag use to a residential use cost us $12,000. If they have, if they have 1.93 in the end, right? Right. So, well, we're, how many people are moving in that don't have kids? <laughs> so right. That, that's the delta between two and right. 1.93. Right. So, well, so it, it's so. no, it's 1.93 and 0.77 is I think what we've kind of agreed with that 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 the 1.93. Well, <laughs> it, it doesn't. The one point doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Whether it's 12,000, whether it's 8,000, whether it's 4,000.
so from, from a policy perspective, even if we can't stop the bill, but from a policy perspective, we should be discouraging them from a future land use perspective. We can, we can stop development, but we can manage no, but We can stop with special, we can manage special development use and, and, and on conditional use. And when somebody comes in to convert the zoning from one to another, because we have people standing up saying that they don't agree with the change now, but we bend over for certain things to come in. And a lot of it has been in the past couple of years, residential development. The, the, the whole point of this argument is that it's costing us a lot for, every, for the average residents, the, the average taken across the whole board. That's costing the county a lot of money. So how do we stop that? How do we, or how do you offset it? It's, it's going to be commercial you development and industrial development. That doesn't yeah. make any difference which. You've got to get, grow both of those. We've got to stop the drain on the taxpayers by requiring development that's got mixed uses so that we're getting an equal amount. The industrial development, I, I totally agree. If we can get industrial development in here, that's going to help. But that's also not the only one. I, mean, I, I know this is not necessarily germane to this conversation. Kind of this was started it but, but it i didn't became the conclusion that it doesn't matter how many acres it is but five ten twenty it's, it's a house a house with two children one hundred three children that's what costs us yeah yeah i mean we'd have to um yeah i could easily come up with that number i mean it's 26 and Especially at the 200,000, 204 or 205, yeah, you're no at our current tax rate. And the other thing is, is if we talk about the tax rates going down, that creates the problem, it makes the problem even worse. So, so we're in this in the next step, did that last bullet on Kyle's yes. slide down at the bottom where, where he said he, look, he, he was going to look at the build out? I guess one of the questions that we're going to be confronted with is. You know, if it takes forty thousand rooftops to get to a place where we can we can have a pharmacy, right? Do it, and and we're using land at you know doing one and two acre lots. I mean, how how much of the county are we going to eat up? And another approach might be to create denser, really really pack the pack the density in so that if we need forty thousand people, we're not eating up two thirds of the county. We're, we're limited to really high density where we have water and sewer. Well, so then that would be that would be a limit, a, a limiter, right? And that 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 in of itself would would would, well, would limit the central garage halo area. You're almost at your max capacity. So even in our areas that we have King William version of high density, we're at our limits on what we're able to actually have for water and sewer that's coming out of there, and. We don't own the water treatment plant anymore. That's HRSD. And if HRSD doesn't want to hook up somebody because it's three miles down the road, they don't have to hook them up. So that, that, that would that would that would absolutely throttle the development. And, and I don't know that we want to shut it off. If we have high enough, but if we have high enough density, it's worth HRSD. <clears throat> absolutely. Yes. If you force everybody to do it. So you don't want to force the um the high density outs where they've got to do water. And, I mean, no, that, that, up to, <laughs> that, that argues keeping it tight, right? And and so so I, 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 well, it, you can't do water and septic. You can't do well and septic on a small parcel of land correct. either. Right, right now, you've correct. got to have larger parcels in order to do that. And so, so I guess the, the and, and we'll learn this answer right when when Kyle comes back with the build out study. You know how many. What does it look like? How much, how much land are we actually going to eat up? Like, you know, I mean, it's well, right now. <clears throat> right now, the commercial, the, the development along 56 the corridors, a very small percentage of the whole county. We've got a lot of room to grow, but we're trying to preserve that rural landscape as much as we can, and we can do that by developing this 56 the corridor area. Uh, no, we don't have water and sewer now to serve that, but we will. I mean, the plan is, our, our water right now is based off of the aquifers that we, we have established. Yeah, 
but those aquifers have a limit to what how many people you can put on them. Well, I mean that's that's the question I'll have to ask. Uh, so, then you, so then you <laughs> but, get into reservoirs and uh, it, it takes us to all sorts of places. That. But I'm just just I, I'm just, just saying that, that I, I that get it. right. Well, yeah, we got to sure. purchase all that land. I, I we don't have to get so. So I'm trying to think of how, how do we move this conversation forward, right? So Chris has given us a, a great reference point and, and he, he's taken the time to do it. And I'm, we're grateful that, that to have you and to have you, you know, wasting your own time doing that. I like, for us. I like this kind of stuff. And right, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's helpful. To, to Again, it, it's assumption based. Yeah. All the assumptions can change. I'm happy to run the scenarios. I turn the model over to you, but it's not, not I mean, it, it's not a deliverable. It's, it's it's ugly, and and you can't just change one number without knowing kind of what the impacts are. And that's, that's my biggest fear with releasing it is, you know, you can get the numbers and say whatever you want them to, but um, you kind of have to know how they how they work together. It, I mean, just to your point though, I mean, the whole concept about you know the pharmacies and everything else. My biggest fear is is it's the build it and they will come model. Right. Well, we don't. We're not assured that anybody's going to come if we build. If we continue, you know, we, the, the argument for res, letting all this ha residential development happen, let it go, 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 is oh, we need the rooftops to get the pharmacy. Well, if we get all the rooftops and we keep multiplying this twelve thousand over and over and over again, and the pharmacy never comes, then is the pharmacy even going to pay for that twelve thousand times forty thousand? Right. I mean, if we go go forward to the very last slide, because that's the one that really scared me when I did it. Um, or two slides from this. So this was looking at different scenarios. Then you start looking at clusters and subdivisions. You start multiplying that number out by 200. Now, again, it's based on the 1.93. So we could argue that one on this scenario definitely should probably change. But the numbers get ugly quick. You know, when you start talking about 200 houses, some of these large subdivisions I've heard about, you know, the issue is the same. For, if, there's 1.93 students and 1.88 vehicles, and they're assessed at that values and everything else. Uh, there was one scenario that was 234 uh, acres, 268 houses at one point. That was going to cost you 3.3 million a year. Um, another scenario of 100 acres of 80 houses cost you a million. Um, you know, you really only start to look somewhat positive when you get to 200 acres and only have eight parcels on it. All right. Yeah, so that's a large. Well, Mr. Green, you know. you've got your work cut out for you. I'd say you also need a team that can attract that business and close that deal. So I, I tell you, I tell you, I tell you what I what I think about is like if the EDA does something like this, right? We go and and we develop something. We pad ready, ready to go. Put it on the internet. You know, here's our price. We got to make it happen. 
that means you and you and me. We're going. We're we're banging on doors until it happens because we've committed county funds. Oh, absolutely. Right. So so we just we need to not stumble. And uh, but again, my scenario, yeah. even if we're beating on doors, it, right? it's up to the landowner. Right. right. I think the alternative. From our perspective, we should have this. Oh, no, I agree. And so over 20 years, you know, we can sit around and lose $67 million and we'd be just as dumb for right. making a $200,000 investment in a, in a piece of property. So where, where I was going with it, 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 yeah, where I was going with it is, so what it's really important that we do the second step of this, of this exercise so that we're not just investing in something and hoping it happens. Right, we're, we're investing in something if we choose to move forward, and we have a plan, and we know how to do it, and we know who to target, right, and how to make it happen with the least amount of effort because we're all volunteers. Right. And then we have one thing, you know, maybe we can even take this into a field trip or have a conversation. We can find another because in the near the term, we don't want to cancel. Well, yes, it's going to grow up, and we can't close all the cost of the epicenter. We're like two steps out from there. So maybe we can find counties that are going through or have gone through, you know, they're that second step out bedroom community. And we can be like their successes. And now we're armed with our data that they probably don't have, and maybe they do. They don't have Chris. Well, it's Chris going, oh, yeah. well, it's all <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, 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 it's hard. That we can go to the people who are in our shoes or currently in our shoes, and we can learn from their mistakes. Uh, that's great. Uh, it, I mean, I'll, I'll give up a day or two. You know, that's, I, how does that? That's that's a great idea. And, yeah, and, and you, you mentioned the cannery. I mean, why don't we organize a field trip? Let's go see it. Right. Right. I, I was in North Carolina. We could go visit with a customer, yeah. and they're essentially two steps out Charlotte. They're a king one. And you drive around. There's fifteen to twenty light industrial manufacturing. It could be agricultural. Could be anything. There's farms right around it, and you hit a little. Couple five ten acre homes, and you know I said, "Wow, this is what we need. We need a place that revenues three million dollars. They have a salesman, two office staff. Don't need a well. You know they got maybe a bathroom, a break room, and that's it. No massive septic. Operating out of shell, and, and that you know three four million in sales can give us real revenue and give you know employment of fifty to eighty thousand dollars a person." But just finding places like that, and we can learn from them. Because we're not going to be in the tank, so the tank is so close to Richmond. We're kind of that two steps out. That was one of the points that Kyle made in the last uh, in the last presentation. Is he, he said we're on the edge, like the edge of the Richmond market. So we're just we're just a little different. But our strength is that we're close enough to the Northern Neck market. Where Maybe we can offer something that they would have to come you know, all the way to Richmond, otherwise, for and we're much closer for that gateway, right? And we talked about that a, a, a couple of times. Um, right? so like you know, a meat processing plant would be an example of that. Like, if we got one here, right. and you go to slaughter a pig now, you call around and they're they're a year out from their right. appointment. So, so, I mean, we'll it's pull it from well, yeah, multiple that, that's a huge thing. I mean, I, I know that from my neighbors who raise hogs. Um, the other thing, Goochland, just uh, one of the uh, the farmers that, that I get lettuce from, Greenswell Growers, he built a $17 million hydroponic lettuce factory on one acre of land. All I needed was an acre. So we need to be talking to you. How do you feel about how do you feel about hydroponics? Guys? I mean, I love it. It's great stuff. I mean, I think, but it's agriculture. I mean, it, 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 it's 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 not row cropping. It, you know, it's, it's it's a changing world. Does that become like a massive Uh, all the wholesale. I mean, they're they they retail sell wholesale on all that. I mean, you know, I, I pay I pay people and sales tax. I mean, I'm ag, but I pay all that tax. It's I'm not, um, you know, I'm not tax free. I mean, I I I pay those tax. I pay people tax. I pay sales and use tax. Um, not meals tax. Not meals tax. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so let's pretty, see. Pretty so, solid. Um, uh, um, is, is there is there anybody else have a, is there a burning desire to, to, to throw anything else out on the table? Or have we, um, it worked for everything. Um, Chris, thank you so much yeah. for your time. Hey, uh, and I'm more than happy to run scenarios. I mean, that, this thing is, is this is dynamic. And and what does this look like? What does that look like? It take will take me no time to send you a snapshot like that of, of various different scenarios. And if you come up with different assumptions that we want to use or different data, well, well, let's update it and go. I mean, it's, it's that's wonderful. It's thank good. you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. All right. Um, Let's see. So, uh, um, treasurer's report. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, chairman's report. Um, I don't have anything to report. Um, unfinished business. Uh, let's see. You want? You want to talk? Sure. You, you've got something scheduled. Gene and I and uh, Stacy from the small farm extension that we came to present to us last time and. That Two citizens, perhaps that can include Mr. Breeden, are going to take a trip to visit the demonstration farm in Foster County with an idea to kind of noodle a little bit more on the idea of doing one of these um, value added uh, ag manufacturing kind of businesses um, here in the county. Um, so we think that states will be helpful in kind of thinking through how we might be able to collect um, some resources and maybe get something going and then possibly attract a, a business provider. I think that's on March 22nd. So we're heading back to Boston. Uh, that'll, that'll be, uh, yeah, I'm, I look forward to hearing about that. Um, public comment period. Does anybody got anything to say? Glad to hear from you. Um, next meeting is the 13th, April 13th. Uh, if I'm in yeah, yeah. Um, if y'all would get, if, if, the, uh, if the EDA folks would get comments back to Ms. Graham. About its own future land use map, about anything else in the comp plan, preferably by May, so March 23rd, but definitely by March 1st. And Ms. Graham, can you say a little bit about the Marmite, how that's going to work? We're going to have a uh, public meeting tomorrow. Um, we'll be able to have Hill Studio there doing everything. Um, presentation, have some mapping, um, answer any questions, take any comments that anyone has. And then we'll, then we'll incorporate them um, in our draft that we're working on. And so everyone's invited. So the public will be here. So so David Hill, who's actually the head of the Hill Studio, he'll be doing the presentation. And then we'll close the invite to come up to speak, or will they just ask the audience folks to stand up? How's that going to work? They'll be able to come up and, and speak. Um, like I said, we'll try to answer the questions that they have. Um, take down any information they want to provide you know any of their ideas we want with their ideas and that's seven o'clock morning correct here that's the order okay john just so let's see so so um I, I think the thing to do is to start an email chain and uh, uh among the, the eda with with comments any, any comments we may have and I'll, I'll be glad to start that chain and then We'll just we'll, I'll, I'll just hit send it to everybody, and if you've got comments, send them back to me. I'll compile them, and then I'll get them to you. Okay, Miss Brand. Okay. Um, let's see. We've got a closed meeting, so I, I need a motion to convene a closed session. Actual wording. Um. Uh, let's see. Well, there it is. Thank you. So it magically appeared. I, I move to complete and close the meeting for the section 2.3 dash 3711 of the Code of Conditions for Personnel Matters involving the appointment and intake of the Board of Commissions in accordance with the rest. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Yes, you probably have So, so the. Uh, if, if there's no objection, the planning commission will go ahead and adjourn for time. Is there any objection? Okay. Okay. We are adjourned. And thank you all very much for Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Motion passes. I move to certify the closed meeting. Got a second?
Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? What's that? Oh, okay. Mr. Brown? Aye. Mr. Hodges? Aye. Mr. Pearson? 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 Aye. Mr. <laughs> All right. Move to adjourn. That's it. Second. Okay. Second. Uh, All in favor? Aye. Uh, All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Yeah. Chris, thank you so much for keeping us straight, keeping me straight. It's